people and yes it is happening live at the Monty Suites Conference Center in the city of Cross River State, Calabar, Nigeria. I am Queen Sam and I'm with the very very beautiful Ruth Obo. Hello Ruth. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's the Lida Olumba Olumba Obu third edition of the annual public lecture with the theme Unity in Diversity as Key for Peace and Sustainable Development. Yeah, we are here live at Montesuit Hotel Conference Center and we'll be hoping to see our special guest of honor soon you know, to speak about the annual lecture. We are expecting something very huge from them. So stay with us, don't go nowhere. Yes, yeah, stay with us because we'll be expecting, like Sister Ruth um, spoke about, we'll be expecting to see a lot of dignitaries. Permit me to just let the cat out of its bag. Today we'll be seeing the ex-president of the Re Democratic Republic of Congo, no other than His Excellency Joseph Kabila, who served as the fourth president of that beautiful country. We'll also be seeing the ex-president, the second president of Mozambique, no other than his excellency, his name is Chisano, if I got that right, Joaquim Chisano, he's going to be here present to deliver a lecture. Another beautiful thing is that we'll also be seeing the 16th president of Ramakrishna Mission and Ramakrishna Math. If you know what Ramakrishna means, it's a different religion on its own and bring, it brings me back to the topic of discourse for today unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development so we'll get to find out the points these people these dignitaries will be raising here and how these various diverse um, views can actually you know have a united front to lead man to the next level so stay tuned as we'll be connecting you with some you know dignitaries that are present already behind me you can see if you can see the hall it's been a set up at the moment the ushers the international ushers are here ensuring that everyone is you know peacefully and beautifully seated the, um, the sound guys, the technical guys are actually doing their job. The decorators are already done. So in no fewer moments from now, we'll be expecting the event to commence proper. But before then, we'll get to speak with some of the you know, guys behind the scenes, the planning committee members, and some dignitaries we can you know, get in touch with to keep you updated concerning today's event. Do not go anywhere. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are live.
Thank you so much for staying tuned with BCS Talk Cross Television. Like we said earlier, it is the long expected day, the day for the TED edition of the Lida Olumba Olumba Obo annual public lecture and today it is happening live at the Monte Suite Conference Center Cross River State Nigeria and today I have the privilege to host this event is actually attracting a lot of media practitioners from all over the country because it's one of its kind and I'm very very privileged to have the opportunity to speak with a veteran journalist from the pioneer newspaper Akwaiban State. Good morning sir how are you doing i'm fine please could you just introduce yourself quickly for us my name is idong i work for pioneer newspapers a quiet state newspaper all right thank you so much thank you so much with your years of experience i'm pretty sure this event is coming for you to be here represented by yourself tell us why you felt like you had to be here yourself yes because this is an annual event okay. and i'm happy that god has made this day a reality and uh, it, this event attracts people from all over the world to come and see and witness what the leader is doing, not only in Cross River and not only in Nigeria, but all over the world. Okay, thank you so much for that point. All right, the um, topic for discussion today is unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. I know you are here in the capacity of the media to get to find out what um, the keynote speakers as well as every other speakers for today will say concerning that topic. But from your own standpoint, what do you think or what are you expecting from today's program? As journalists, we set our agenda. And one of the things we preach is peace peace in Nigeria and peace all over the world so that as we have these events I pray God that the peace that we envisage peace that is not very common in some part of Nigeria with these events God will use it and bring peace and sustainable peace into this country and the world all over Amen. I say amen to that. All the best in your assignments today. All right, stay tuned with Star Cross Television as we connect you to authentic roots. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning. Nice to have you. Dr. David Ako. I'm the head of communication, mass communication at the Javis University. Oh, nice to meet you, sir. I am Queen Sam, Star Cross Television presenter. Very
thank you so much for staying tuned with BCS Talkers Television, still in the celebration, or rather the public lecture, the annual public lecture of Lida Olumba Olumba Obu, the third edition happening here in Cross River State, Nigeria, Manti Suite Conference Center. Like I said earlier, this is one of its kind event as it has attracted media professionals from various parts of Nigeria and wonderful personalities from across the world. Today I have the honor or privilege to speak to the head of department from Otto Javis University across River State, Nigeria, no other than Mr. David Ako. I am the head of department of mass communications at Otto Javis University in Akpabio, Calabar. So much for coming. But first of all, why are you here? Like I said earlier, we have media practitioners, but we don't have head of departments coming. So tell us why you're here. Well, I'm just another media practitioner. I happen to be a media practitioner in the academic domain. Okay. And you know that is where it begins because we form these media practitioners who become media practitioners all over in you know, all the various aspects of uh, mass media. So you're here to get scoop for academic purposes, should I say yes. so? Uh, you could say so. The truth of the matter is when you come to monumental events like this, because I consider this a very monumental event, because it has personalities from around the globe and uh, locally, and uh, this is all to the glory and of uh, Lida Olumba Olumba Obu, who is in himself a magnanimous personality. I mean, that is not in dispute. You cannot dispute that. But I'm here to get that scoop, just like you rightfully say, about the academic aspect of this. How we can harness the power that is going to manifest in here for academic purposes, for posterity. Still on academic purposes, you've heard about the topic for discussion today, unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. Do you truly believe that there can be a unified system of various views and perspectives that can lead us to the next stage? Well, it is extremely tricky yeah. in the sense that when you talk about unity, it automatically indicates that there is this unity somewhere, in some realm. So we need to find a niche on how to harness this and make everybody know that your difference is your power and not your undoing. It has become a very tricky facet globally for a very long time. That is why people have different religions, different beliefs and all that. But we still have to live in a global world where we come together and have one purpose, which is life itself. Anything that threatens all of us, which is existential, like the AIDS pandemic, like the coronavirus pandemic, you see that everybody throws away their differences and come to the fold to make sure that we don't get extinct because that is our principal purpose. So I believe that unity and diversity, the topic of this conference is extremely crucial. If everybody could come to the fold and put hands on deck and make sure that we know we are all threatened so we can do something about it, I think it will work. Thank you so much for your um, viewpoints concerning that. Let's keep our fingers crossed for what's going to happen today. Stay tuned as I connect you back to my co-presenter for more interviews on Starcross Television. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much, Queen Sam. Still in the spirit of the third edition of the annual leader Olumba Olumba Obu annual lecture, I have with me His Grace Archbishop Professor Ilami Krama, who is going to be telling us how the theme of today's lecture will be of benefit to the world at large. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good morning. I am happy that this is taking place. Brotherhood is the essence of the human race. What Olumba has brought to bear is a legacy that the world, the dying world, our world is in pain, our world is in comatose. What we need is the legacy of Lida Olumba Olumbo. And what is it all about? It's about love, it's about tolerance, about understanding. We must break from this uh, religious intolerance and look at our common humanity. And this is what Olumba has brought. So the lecture, before you start developing, the development is geared towards improving human race. And so you must understand the theories, the, 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 the trajectories that will bring the human race together before development. If there is no peace, there can be development. And so the unity of the human race is what Lira Olumbo Olumbo has come to lay bare, to tell us that in Isaiah 11, 1 to 2, in the new kingdom of God, the ants will stay together, the lion will stay together. That even when a kid puts his hand into the wasp, it will not bite. That is the centerpiece of brotherhood where there is all inclusiveness. And so the legacy lecture is a trajectory to point to the human race, that the solution to a human problem is very, very, very close and very, very available. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ilami Krama. Uh, stay with us as I link you back to Queen Sam.
thank you so much authentic roots for connecting back to me you're still watching the third edition of the leader olumba olumba Obu annual public lecture here in monte suite conference center cross river state nigeria like i said earlier this event is one of its kind because it has attracted various personalities and even media uh, practitioners from across Nigeria and the world in general. Today I have the correspondence of the, the Cross of the States correspondent of Business Day newspaper Lagos States, no other than Mr. Mike Abam. Nice to have you here today, sir. So tell us about your expectations from today's event. What are you expecting to, you know, cover from the event of
found that comfort as glory. Star Crest Television, God's own TV, cordially invites the entire human family to come and felicitate as well as give a shout out to the glory of God Almighty, personified with a new name, Lida Olumba Olumba Obu, the ancient of days, the sole spiritual head of the entire universe on the celebration of his divine manifestation on earth. This divine opportunity of gratitude to God in this Advent is open to all members and non-baptized members as the blessings of appreciating the Father cannot be quantified by any measure. Come, let's celebrate Him in His beauty and splendor. Come, let's magnify Him in His glory. Come, let all sing and dance for He who was, is, and forever shall be. The categories of this one Wonderful opportunity include individuals, families, groups, Bethels, fellowships, buddies, companies, captain of industries, traditional ruling councils, corporate bodies, states, and nations. Let all that have breath say thank you, Father, at a very affordable cost. This is a bonus for all elects of God across the globe in this dispensation. Grab your space now and thank the Supreme Deity for keeping Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. All payments should be made to Star Cross TV accounts with details Bank, Union Bank, Account Name Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, Account Number 00427782269. All evidences should be forwarded to this WhatsApp number plus 234704554. 1089. Come one, come all. Let's rejoice with the maker of heavens and the earth, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, for his kindness upon mankind. For more inquiries, please call Starcross TV official line on plus 234-70-455-4189. Sign management. Thank you, Father. And rejoice in his Who is the master? The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom, and the tongues speak what is just. This is found. In Psalm 37, verse 30, the entire creation's spirits and angels celebrate the bearer of the supreme light and the giver of the everlasting gospel, great leader, Olumba Olumba Obu, whose teachings have eroded the increase in divine knowledge, wisdom, and have positively influenced activities around the globe. Brotherhood of the Cross and Star invites the entire world to Nigeria as we mark the third edition of Lida Olumba Olumba Obo Public Lecture. Leaders around the world that have been influenced by the divine teachings and presence of the Godhead, great leader Olumba Olumba Obo will gather to reflect on the divine teachings of the Holy Father with the theme, Unity in Diversity as Key to Peace and Sustainable Development. The date is Saturday, 18th December 2021. The venue is Montesuits Conference Center, Calabar, Nigeria. Come and witness the truth about the living God. For more information, call plus 234-803-947-7296. And yes, we are back on Starcrest Television for the third uh, edition of the annual lecture, public lecture of Lida Olumba Olumba Obo. This event is actually happening during the period where Brotherhood of the Crescent Star celebrates the divine manifestation of the founder, leader of Brotherhood of the Crescent Star, Lida Olumba Olumba Obo. Today, I am with the chairman for the protocol committee of this divine manifestation committee, no other than Christ Ambassador Julius Inyananyo. Peace of the Father, sir. Perfect peace. Sir. Nice to have you here today. Thank you. All right, so you are in charge of protocol committee, which is basically event management, ensuring all the shareholders. It's more like the project committee stuff. So tell us about your work and what you were able to do to get us to this point. 
in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Uh, we thank the Father immensely for today. As you know, today is the third edition of the uh, annual leader Lumbo Lumbo Bu uh, public lecture in honor of the ancient of days, the sole spiritual head of the universe, great leader Lumbo Lumbo Bu. Uh, we've gathered here uh, to celebrate our father. And then we will inv we've invited children from all over the world, all over the world, from America, from the US, from other part of Africa, to come and sh share in this uh, celebration. Uh, I want to say that um, most of our invitees are here present. Any moment from now, they will uh, soon be here to uh, grace this ceremony to the glory of our Father. Thank you so much, um, the protocol chairman. Talking about the invitees, I think that some question will be in the minds of my viewers as to why we are extending something that has to do with BCS, Lida Olumba Olumba Obo, our father, why we are extending invitation to non-members of the folds. So tell us why. You see, our father, great Lida Olumba Olumba, is the God of all. And he has his children outside BCS and they need to come and partake of this uh, blessing. Most of the children outside know him. Uh, it's just that they've not come to wear the white with us. They know him. And just like the team of this um, uh, public lecture, unity in diversity as key to sustainable uh, development. Unity is important. African unity is important. It's key to economic uh, development. Unity all over the world is important. And you know, our father has always preached. Hinged is preaching on love one another. And that is the unity we are talking about. We want to tell the world the practical works of our father. In God, there is no division. There is no division amongst the children of God. We are all one. So an invitation is extended to all and sundry to be part of this uh, occasion. All right, thank you so much. Wish you the best. Let's not keep you too long so you can get back to your critical duties. All the best, sir. Thank you very much. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. All right, you're still watching the third annual lecture of Lida Olumba Olumba Obo. And like he said, we have ex uh, invitations have been sent to various people to attend this event. And we earlier on introduced to you few of the people we'll be expecting to deliver an address on the topic unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. A little bit about the agenda for today. While the event is yet to commence officially, which is why we are bringing this interview to you now at this point, so that you get to know more about the event and what we'll be expecting for today. The event is actually divided into five parts. The first part will be arrivals and introduction, where we'll be having the invitation, the invited guests and participants seated comfortably on their seats, and then we'll also be having any opening prayers, event slogan by His Grace Archbishop Dagogo Obene. We'll be having purpose of the annual lecture, introduction of the moderators and the assistants by the Petra Christ Shepherd Ekuma Ungu and the Petra Christ Shepherd Joseph Abba, who is the BCS Information Officer. Thereafter, we'll be moving into the second part of today's event, which will be anthem rendition, keynote addresses, and interludes. Then we'll move to the third part of the event, which is public lecture proper. I will be having an introduction of each speaker. We'll be doing the profiling, and then we'll have short speeches, entertainment, and summary of lectures by the moderators. Thereafter, we'll be having the Old Holy Father's physical presence as the part four of today's event. And then um, we'll be having that following with rendition of BCS Universal Anthem, BCS Creed and Anthem by the 144,000 virgins and of course the choristers, members of the Christ Natural Choristers Fellowship that which will usher us into the Holy Father's advice and blessings and that will constitute the part four of today's event. Thereafter the part five 
We vote of thanks by the Chairman Planning Committee and ICT Subcommittee, Bishop Trinita Obu, Chairman Closing Remarks, Closing Prayers and Departure. So please stay tuned as the event is yet to commence. This is not the time for you to leave your TV set. Stay tuned again to find out more about the participants that are attending today's event as well as the message on unity and, and diversity, how this can lead to peace and sustainable development. The topic again remains unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. We'll be right back shortly with more interviews from the participants here present. Who is the master? Whoa. The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom the and the tongues speak what is just. This is found in Psalm 37 verse 30. The entire creation's spirits and angels celebrate the bearer of the supreme light and the giver of the everlasting gospel, great leader, Olumba Olumba Obu, whose teachings have eroded the increase in divine knowledge, wisdom, and have positively influenced activities around the globe. Brotherhood of the Cross and Star invites the entire world to Nigeria as we mark the third edition of Leader Olumba Olumba Obo Public Lecture. Leaders around the world that have been influenced by the divine teachings and presence of the Godhead, great leader Olumba Olumba Obo will gather to reflect on the divine teachings of the Holy Father with the theme, Unity in Diversity as Key to Peace and Sustainable Development. The date is Saturday 18th December 2021. The venue is Montesuits Conference Centre, Calabar, Nigeria. Come and witness the truth about the living God. For more information, call plus 234-803-947-7296 and plus 234-803-770-2023. Bishop Trinita Obu, Chairman Media and Publicity Subcommittee and the Petra Christ Shepherd, Honorable Ekuma Ngu, Secretary International Organizing Committee, announces, Thank you, Father. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Unity in diversity. This is actually a concept that you know involves a, a lot of things about social diversity, uh, political diversity, religious diversity, cultural diversity, and that is why when BCS organizers were planning for this event, they decided to extend invitations to people across different, you know, diverse people across different areas, politically, socially, academically, and religiously, and otherwise. So here we have traditional ruler, and he's going to be introducing himself, his area of jurisdiction, and of course, we'll get to chat with him as to why he is here present. Peace of a father. Please, may we get to know of you? Okay. I am Prince Emmanuel Basi Efium Enifon Ata Ema Ekpo Edem of Ekpo Edem Royal Family in the Four Kingdom. Okay. I'm also a Christ Ambassador in the Brotherhood of the Christ of the Cross and Star. Nice. 
Nice, nice to know you. Nice to have you here with us, chat with us. So tell us from your, you know, from your area, you're coming from the traditional, you're representing the traditional rulers today, even as you are a Christ ambassador. And you've heard about the topic, peace in, um, unity in diversity. So from the traditional angle, tell us about the cultural diversity and how it affects human development and what should be done concerning it. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator. You know, there is a misconception, or do I say uh, most humans have limited knowledge about the universe. The universe is beyond the earth and is beyond human beings. In fact, before now, science told us that we have um, nine planets. But as I speak, more planets are being discovered. And those planets were not made for the sake of just being made. Those planets are occupied by beings who may not be human. In science, they are called alien. But there's something that cuts across the Earth and the other universes. And that is the one factor. In each of these universes, as metaphysics would let us know, there is a common factor that seeks to unify the elements of those universes. But on Earth, as human beings, we are um, grateful and opportune uh, to have His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obu representing that one factor in the human form. And wherever you go to, beyond the limited knowledge of man, you find that one factor being traced to him. And that is why whenever an instruction is given by him, there is always acceptability in all spheres of life, even in the traditional setting. So as a prince in the African kingdom, you know, we deem it fit to be part of this lecture and to hear people from other um, nations give us their view and also put this view to what we already know about the leader of the um, Unified Theocratic Council worldwide. So it's a wonderful event, I know it's going to be, and we are here, and the rest of us are here, about 12 of us are here representing different areas. I'm representing a poor family in Akbabuyo. We are here to also add verb and zest to the lecture. Thank you so much for that one. It was quite interesting to hear your aspect, especially bringing metaphysics into the picture. As a traditional ruler, there have been so many controversies as to traditional rulers identifying themselves as Christians. Even in the kingdom, we've had several people talk about the traditional ruler fellowship and so much concerning it. So what is your view concerning that aspect? Because people say that, if I were to put my mind in the mind of those people asking, their own ideas as is why would someone who practices traditional religion also get to be a priest in Brotherhood of the Cross and Star or be involved in Christian activities? So you are a traditional ruler. Tell us what your, what's your take on that. Well, you know, you know, religion right from time, let us look at the Christianity which is founded by our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. You know, he came to unify. When you talk about love, love is not to divide. Where there is love, it means things come together, there is unity. And in the course of unity, there is going to be some, you know, um, what will I, some separations. Some, there will be some separations to have a perfect unifying factor. Now, there's, it is a misconception for somebody to think that if you are in a traditional institution, you can't be a Christian, or you can't be a perfect Christian, or you will not be a practicing Christian. It's not true. We have our ancestors, yes. Whether you admit it or not, they exist. Beyond aspects ancestors, you have spirit beings. Whether you accept it or not, they exist. You understand? Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the Father of spirit beings, you understand? Now represented by His Holiness Leader Olumba Olumba Obu. You understand?
So one should ask his or himself a question. Why is it that when the name OOO is mentioned, there is acceptability everywhere you go to? And if there is acceptability everywhere you go to, then what is in that name? What is in that personality? You understand? It could be limited knowledge or do I say um, religious fanaticism that makes some person remain in the cocoon of their limited belief. But it's beyond that. The Bible encourages us to read wide, study wide, get to know what is happening. Even as a human being, get to know what is happening beyond your very terrestrial environment. And that broadens your knowledge, it broadens your concept about life. And if somebody whose physical presence might be in a location, but is found in every other sphere of life, and is recognized as a leader wherever, when he speaks, there is acceptance, there is submission, there is recognition, there is humility, there is movement, there is force, then why would you, you know, not yield to such a being? Represented in the human form as leader, His Holiness, leader Olumba, Olumba Obu. So uh, for me, there is no disparity between being a Christian or being um, a, traditional. a traditional ruler because even those spirits are subject to the person that we worship. I think that is why we are talking about the unity in diversity yes. here. I think this is Beyond a human existence. This is a practical um, example for unity in diversity. Thank you so much for having this talk with us. I hope you enjoy the remaining part of the program. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank much. you. I'm grateful. All right, stay tuned as we connect you for more interviews. Oh. Stay tuned as we con you wanted to leave me here. Okay. You have to stay with me until I close this chapter. Stay tuned as we connect you for more that is yet to come. The event is about to start. And of course, we'll still be bringing you more interviews as we progress. So stay tuned with Star Cross Television.
behold the ancient of days. Blessed is he that cometh from Eden. Holy is thy name. I kept looking until his thrones were set up, and the ancient of days took his seat. Yes. His was like one. Yes. The of his head was, was like pure. Like his throne was ablaze with flames. His wings were upon in fire. Daniel saw this in the night vision. John prophesied of his coming. Since 1918, the ancient of days arrived the earth, doing wonders everywhere, setting the captives free, turning sinners to godly nature. The ancient of days, I am that I am. Holy, who Ancient of days, welcome to your world. Your coming has brought salvation to man. Ah, all nations, all the creatures must bow before the ancient of days. Every thongs in heaven and on earth shall declare your glory. Marvelous is thy name. Every knee must bow. At your throne, in worship of thy holy name, O Lord, you shall be exalted above all other names. You are worthy to be praised. You shall be called Counselor, Marvelous, Powerful, Everlasting Father. There is no one like you. The ancient of days. Give him glory, give him honor, glory. give honor and majesty. Power be unto the ancient of days. Before the mountains were born, he gave birth to the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, he remains God forever. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He deserves all honor, let of glory and adoration be ascribed to him alone. He hold the ancient of days. The ancient of days, I am that I glory, am. Honor, the one and only living God, the beginning and the end. Be unto the ancient of days. The ruler of all creatures, the greatest nation, the supreme deity. Welcome to your world. Be unto the ancient of the Lord. Father. I have silver and gold to offer unto thee, and to sing this melodious song to thee, Father. I am I the musical king. I say, welcome to you, all. welcome to you. All. Thank you, Father. BBCS music. <laughs>
Thank you so much for staying tuned with BCS Star Cross Television. At the moment, while we're still waiting for the event to commence properly, the Christ Natural Courses Fellowship are providing us with wonderful and sweet melodies, as you can hear in the background, just to keep the house warmed up for the event proper. I am here with the Vice Chairman International Planning Committee for the annual lecture of Lida Olumba Olumba Obo. Like we said earlier, this is the third edition so far we've had the first, second and third and no other than His Grace Archbishop Dagogo Obene. Peace of the Father, sir. Perfect peace. Nice to have you here today despite your very tight schedule here in the program. Thanks for having me. All right, so we have been expecting this day to come for so long. How do you feel to finally be here today? Well, um, in the name of our Lord, His Holiness, Olumbo Olumbo Bu, now and forevermore. Indeed, I'm extremely excited because it's a day that we all clamored for, and finally, Father has brought it to a physical materiality. So we thank Him for this whole thing in the name of our lord his holiness olumbo olumbo amen amen okay this is annual public lecture and you've had like a year to plan for this event and its expectations are really really high i've spoken to a few um, participants and they are expecting the presence of various dignitaries so i'd like to know why this particular set of dignitaries were selected and is there something behind we need to you know expect from their um, addresses today yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Actually, you know, it's called public lecture. And public lecture is not an in-house something. Public lecture is all about bringing in, you know, um, people, highly placed personalities from all walks of life. And that is why the chairman had to go, you know, because the father, he looked at the father's statement and said, public lecture. Now, it is through this means we can also codedly and evangelize. So what he did was to invite these personalities. Now, they will come in the name of public lecture. But in all, is to you know, open up to them who our Holy Father is in the name of our Lord, His Holiness, Olumbo, Olumbo, Olumbo. So it is this third um, annual public lecture, I would say, it's as um, really demonstrated or is about to demonstrate what our Holy Father want us to do in the years past. Okay, thank you so much, Your Grace. All right, let's look at the theme for today's event, and it is unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. I'm a little bit concerned about sustainable development. Why, how do you think unity in diversity can lead to sustainable development? In the name of our Lord, His Holiness, Olumbo, 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 now and forevermore. Now, unity in diversity means we have, in my father's house, are many mansions. And so we have a lot of Christian organizations. Talking about, um, if I would talk about the Hindus and all that, and all that, Muslims and all the Islam and all that. But then, all of us narrowed to one personality, and that is God. But in all of this, if we come together in love, we'll be able to break barriers. And what are the barriers? Barriers, I would say, this is my God. This is my God. I'm a Muslim, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Christian. And so, but if we have love, we'll be able to come together as one because we all are worshiping the same God that one God, and that is the Father. And so, if we plan and demonstrate the love the Father has shown to us, then of course there will not be barriers. There will be that sustainability in terms of development. Talking about development, we are talking about the human capital development in terms of the Father's wisdom. Those teachings He has put down to us. Those are the development, and also looking at that, you know, talking about the other aspect of life, the macro society, we're not, we are not going to look at, okay, this person is my is black, he should, he should have this, this person is white, he should not have this. There will not be all that barrier. So we'll have love, will not develop everything. 
and it will be sustained in the name and power of our Father. Amen. Thank you so much for that enlightening man. Dan, before we continue, I can see that we are about to um, you know, welcome the presence of, let's say, a dignitary into the event center. I really have little information concerning that. So let's link you to what's happening right here at Monty Suite Conference Center. Do not forget you're watching the third edition of the annual lecture of Lida Olumba Olumba Obu. Over to you.
them life. Gentlemen, you are all welcome to this very epoch-making occasion of the third edition of the public lecture of leader Olumba Olumba Uburu. My job today is just very simple, and we are going to just do that and get the occasion started. My name is Patra Christ Shepherd Joseph Aya Abba. By the grace of our Almighty Father, I am the Information Officer of Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, and the Coordinator of Masters of Ceremony, Moderators and Interpreters of Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. I am here to introduce I am here to introduce the moderators and MCs for this noble occasion of today, and then they take us up from there. If you look at your program, for those of you that are already holding one, this is on item number three, but we are bringing it just right here at this four because we were waiting for the presence of the chairman of this public lecture who is already seated with all our invited guests. The first moderator is father's own son also that resides in Canada. He goes by the name Dr. Francis Okezie. Okezie is Chief Operating Officer and Director Smart Med Services Group. He lives in Canada. Dr. Okezie, please put your hands together as he walks to the podium. You can do better than that. Put your hands together. <laughs> Just greet the house. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the annual lecture, the third annual lecture of Leader Olumba Olumba Obo. Thank you very much. Dr. Okezie is not going to do this alone because, as you are aware, this is a universal public lecture, he is going to be on the podium with the following. Christ Ambassador Julius Nyanayo. Julius Nyanayo is a master degree holder in precision psychology and also he is an administrator and a personal psychologist, a public speaker. Christ Ambassador Julius Nyanayo, if you are here, please make your way to the stage. Put your hands together. So this young man, as he moves to the stage. Julius, please greet the house. Peace of the Father, brethren. The third person is a sister, is a female, because brotherhood, leader Alumba Alumba teaches gender equality. And therefore, we cannot do anything without making sure all gender is represented. In the name of Allah, His Holiness, Salumba Alumba Abu. This one coming from Bayelsa State, of course, it may interest you to know that Julius is also from Bayelsa State. Sister Blessing Nimibofa, John. She is a broadcast journalist. 
with Baisa State Radio Corporation, and she is an anchor person, a broadcaster, and public speaker. Sister Blessing Nimibofa, please, if you're here, can you please make your way to the stage? This beautiful daughter of the father has come all the way from Bayasa State also to come and do justice to this event. Blessing, please greet the house. Perfect peace, beloved brethren. Sisters, are you in this house? Put your hands together for you. <laughs> At this point, dear brethren, the stage is set and everything is complete for this wonderful public lecture to begin. As we now leave you in the hands of the masters of ceremony and the moderators of this event, that they should please proceed with other proceedings, now and forevermore. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, distinguished brethren, we welcome you formally to this third annual great leader Olumbo Olumbo Bu public lecture in honor of the ancient of days, in honor of the Supreme Father, in honor of the sole spiritual head of the universe, great leader Olumba Olumba Obu. Thank you very much for finding time to be here sit back, relax, and enjoy the lectures that were presented by the erudite personalities here present. And now to kickstart this program, we want to formally commit this program into the guiding hands of the Father. And to do that, may I invite His Grace, Archbishop Dagogo Obene, the immediate past State Administrator, Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, River State, to please step forward and give us the opening prayers. His Grace, please warm round of applause to encourage him. Thanks, praises be given to God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let thanks, honor, glory be given to God in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let all thanks, all honor, dominion, majesty be given unto our Father God for now and evermore. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is thy name, O God, he who was, who is, and ever shall be. Thank you, most heavenly Father, for choosing this day as a day to glorify yourself. Most Heavenly Father, will give thee all thanks, having brought their children from far and near to come and participate in this third annual public lecture. We give thee all glory, forgive us all our sins, sins in words, in action, and in all trances we have sinned against thee. We plead with thee to purify us, spiritual and physically fit, for this public lecture. Give us the intellect, take away the wax off from our ears, scale off from our eyes and give us understanding so that we will have supernatural understanding as it has to do with this public lecture. Thank you, most heavenly Father. We sincerely believe you have deposited the Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us. And as we are here, you have enveloped us with your love because your love is the only perfect love that rules the entire universe. Thank you, most heavenly Father. For all is well from the beginning of this public lecture till the end, for now and evermore. Amen. Let all thanks, praises be given unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let glory, thanks be given to God in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let all thanks, all honor, all majesty, all power, all authority be given unto our Father greatly, the Lumbo Lumbo Boo, for now and evermore. You are all welcome to the Lida Olumba Olumba Obu Third Annual Lecture. We now want to thank 
all those that came from far and wide to witness this occasion today. Particularly, I want to acknowledge and thank our speakers, um, Lawson Ngubus, UK, Kenya. Thank you for taking all the pains and time out to be with us today. We also recognize Professor Ndaha for also finding time to be with us. Ambassador Abdul Salam, Baxman, Ebuzu, we thank you also for finding time to be with us. All our guest speakers, including those that have come from within, both uh, those within the, the BCS and those within Calabar and those within other parts and jurisdictions of Nigeria. We thank you for coming together with us this day so that we can all sit back and celebrate a being that was made, that was manifested in this environment and then to also drink from the fountain of knowledge of from very experienced minds that are coming to share with us a very different, unique perspective of African unity. We thank you all for finding time to come. I will have uh, my co-MC to please acknowledge and, and greet the, some of our brethren that are from within. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we go on to recognize some of the dignitaries we have here present with us, I'd like us to first of all chant the slogan for this very event, talking about the third edition of the Holy Father's Lecture. I'll take it once, then you will repeat after me. We're going to do that three times. The slogan for this event is to make the whole world one a task that must be done. Please repeat after me. To make the whole world one is a task that must be done. Again. To make the whole world one is a task that must be done. To make the whole world one is a task that must be done. Please put your hands together for yourselves. The theme song is We Are One. Choristers, please. We are one. We are one. We are one. One in the Lord. We are one. Please, may we all be on our feet. Among the brethren, no more division among the sisters, no more division among the children of God. We are one, one forever. We are one, so we are one. We, we are one, come together. We, we are one. one, one, one. one. No more division among religion. No more division among the children of God. We are one, one forever. We are one. So we are one. We are one. Come together. We are one. That 
that's not good enough. You can do better. Please put your hands together for yourself. Thank you very much. At uh, this point in time, I'll hand over the microphone to CA Julius Yanayo to continue with recognition of dignitaries. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished brethren. Three hearty cheers to the Holy Spirit. That's beautiful, that's unique. That is the uniqueness of brotherhood of the cross and star. Uh, we want to proceed with some of recognition. May I most humbly uh, recognize in our midst the busiest spokesman, Christ Shepherd, Edet Edet Achibong. Edet Achibong is a retired director of economic geology from the National Geoscience Agency. Patrick, you're welcome. That is the spokesman for BCS. Please, warm round of applause for him. Also in our midst, I want to humbly recognize His Grace, Honorable Alex Okam. He is a former member of the National Assembly, precisely the House of Representative Nigeria. Warm round of applause. I also wish to recognize present here the Dean of the College of Bishop Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, the Patrick Basi Imo, is accompanied by his beautiful spouse. She is the president of the Women Fellowship Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. Warm round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you. Also present in our midst, we want to recognize the director of security, Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, retired, Commodore P.J. Ackman. Please clap for him. I also want to recognize a former director of security, retired Brigadier General Enang Essien. Warm round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I recognize all our royal fathers that are present here. I recognize from the academia, led by Professor Ilami Kramer of the Department of Theater Arts, University of Port Harcourt. is leading the team of academic dons. I can see Dr. Ezezebel, Associate Professor Commander Thomas, Dr. Wori E.G. Wori, who just bagged his PhD in law. Please warm round of applause for all of them. <laughs> Let me recognize one of our speakers, the Patrick Christ Shepherd Oga. Osim, he's here in our midst, he's one of our resource persons for today. Please, a beautiful round of applause for him. Also present here is retired Brigadier General Enang Ogakuo, one of our guests. He's here, please, if you are there, by wave of hand, let's see you. We also have Evangelist Dr. Stephen Eneje, Director Evaluation, Director of Public Service and Evaluation. He is representing the head of the Civil Service Cross River State. Please, warm round of applause for him. Thank you very much. That is Dr. Eneje. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Also here is Dr. David Ako. He is the head of Department Mass Communication of Ato Jaros University Akpabuyo. Please clap for him. Thank you very much. We have representatives of the Commissioner of New City Development, Calabar. He has been represented by Anache Bendi. Please, one round of applause for him. Thank you very much. Also from that ministry, Nkokon Efion, also from the Ministry of New City of the Cross River State Government. We want to recognize your beautiful eminences, Christ, uh, their graces, in no particular order, please, their graces, the Christ shepherds, blessed mothers, the Christ ambassadors of the new kingdom, bishops, and the entire brethren of Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. Not forgetting members of the legal profession of Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. They are all uh, seated here to the glory of the Father. Please, warm round of applause for yourselves. At this point in time, we will take a beautiful anthem rendition by the choir, and after that, we'll take the introduction of the keynotes uh, welcoming the chair that will give us the keynote address, and my colleague, Dr. Francis Okezie, will handle that uh, item. A short, beautiful anthem. Choristers, please. Two minutes, and we'll go into the next uh, item. Thank you very much. Three are the chairs to the Holy Spirit.
very much. Three out of the chest to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that beautiful rendition. We will be getting more of these renditions as it's obvious that our guests are enjoying the spiritual flow of these renditions. Dr. Kezia, please. Now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce the chairperson to give the opening keynote address in the person of the harbinger of the last covenant, His Grace, Archbishop Professor Ike Nathan Uzoma, the ex living Grand Master, Order of Terrestrial and Astral Hierarchy, He's a professor of Christian education of the Thomas Abaka University in Canterbury, United Kingdom, England. He's also the Chancellor of the Global Harvest Christian University, as well as the author of over 70 books and leads a network of international and interreligious silent prayer forum in different nations. Professor Ike Nathan Uzama is also a scholar of extraterrestrial research an advocate of peace, FACOP, Abuja, Nigeria. Even the Yoruba Youth Assembly, 2021 humanitarian icon in Nigeria, as well as a youth role model. Well, help me welcome the harbinger of the last covenant, Professor Ike Nathan Uzoma. Distinguished guests, participants, the press, ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome to the third edition of Leader Olumba Olumba Obu Annual Public Lecture 2021, holding here at Monte Switch. Calabar, Nigeria. We are happy to have you in our midst, especially those of you that have come from far places. And I'm sure you know that this is a public lecture. And if possible, the word public should be underlined and well noted. This is not a church program. This is a public lecture. Because of this, we have people from different backgrounds here, from different religions, from different churches. Even though in the course of the program, ladies and gentlemen, there will be that possibility, considering um, what I may call the mental stances of mass psychology, to bring in fabrics of a belief system in this public lecture. I want to appeal, notwithstanding, to those of you who are not part of uh, that belief system, to please be focused on the overall essence of the public lecture, which is unity in diversity as key to peace and sustainable development. We all need that unity, regardless of your religious background, regardless of, of your belief system, regardless of your mental stances, psychology, amongst others. We all need peace. We all need unity. Like I was just discussing with, um, uh, with His Excellency uh, Lahaji Paxman, uh, the, the, the legate of the Sultan of Sokoto, 
as well as uh, the director of United Nations Polak in Nigeria, we are talking about this unity. If we, there's a neighborhood and the Christian man lives in unity with the Muslim man, the Muslim man lives in unity with uh, somebody of a different background, that unity will engender development. That is why I sincerely appreciate using this opening speech to say that we are very glad for the team of this program, which is unity in diversity. This is needed, not only in our country, even in our local communities, in different nations, enclaves, regions, amongst others. That is the team of this public lecture. Now, the public lecture itself revolves around a name, a personality, leader, Olumba, Olumba, Obo. Leader, Olumba, Olumba, Obo. The personality mentioned has what I will refer for now, for now as multitudinous representations and ultimately multidimensional. To that extent, it is not limited within a belief system. Rather, the personality mentioned is all a compassion and represent different things to different people in our planet, including me. So this annual lecture is the third edition of leader, Olumba, Olumba, Obo, public lecture. And there is no way you can talk about um, um, a public lecture with a personality involved without saying something about that personality. Last, was it last month? Last October 19th, I was given Nelson Mandela's 2021 Award on Excellent Leadership in Nigeria. I got that award. I didn't... But as at the time that the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West Africa, sent the delegate to present that, if, because the award is coined into the name of Mandela, something was said about Nelson Mandela. Now, when we talk about leader Olumba, Olumba Obo, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and my sisters. I know many of you are from different churches. Even I that is here, I am here with more than 35 delegates from different churches. We have leaders of different churches, general overseers here, of different denominations. And some of you may be bamboozled. And if you don't adjust your mental pattern, it may possibly, possibly, I prefer to use the word possibly, offend the fabrics of your being. Now, what are they talking about here? Are they talking about a church leader? And uh, somebody will come up and say, in the name of His Holiness, Olumba, Olumba, Obo. Then what is that name? Who is that? Even if such questions are not asked openly here, they will form basis of mental correlation that if certain points are not made to bring one to a point of certain recognition and within the framework of such thinking, the individual may become more disoriented even upon leaving the lecture ground. So to that extent, it is important that certain things are said. Leader, Olumba, Olumba Obo, his manifestation in our planet, let me say it is multiferous, it is multidinous and multidimensional, intercepted by personalities at different levels to mean different things. And I'm sure when 
Dr. Francis Okese was trying to introduce, introduce me here. He mentioned that I, the one that is talking now, that I am a scholar of extraterrestrial research. That aspect of existence, that aspect of reality, represents also a point of recognition of this personality, in whose name we are gathered here to hold this public lecture. Let me say something briefly. I have taken a time to study the teachings of leader Olumba Olumba Obu. We have here an eminent Christian scholar, Professor Kalisis Ndaha, who is even uh, the founder of a, a Christian university in Nigeria. We train theologians, people. Now, when we talk about leader Olumba Olumba, it does not form, that name does not form any subject in the theological aspect. It doesn't. Rather, even within the system of what we know as eschatology, there are distortions, discrepancies, and misrepresentations that forms a belief system. That is why, Prof, let me tell you, I used to say this. I said, somebody can be a professor of lie. <laughs> you know. You know why I say, I say so? Some of us today, we believe that Jesus Christ will come down from the sky. We are not here to enter into what I may call mental jugglery of religious argument. But you see, the entire evidence being in the Holy Scriptures. If I take a study and become a professor in a particular thinking, and that thinking is embedded in lie, I will end up becoming a professor of lie. So we are here today with people from different religions. Even my son that is recording here, you see him wearing white. He's not a baptized member of the BCS. We have a jury overseer that came all the way from Uweli. They founded a church with her husband, Reverend Pastor Stella. She's, she's here with us. And um, the husband passed away. And she has been partnering partner with my mission, ministry. And many of them are here from different churches. So we want to use this opportunity as we come into the midst. Let us focus on unity. Let us leave our religions alone for now. Because everybody's belief system is important to him. Let me tell you this. Man is a product of belief systems. Everybody's belief system is important to him. We are not here, especially myself, I am not here to superimpose a particular belief system on anyone. Never. But we are here hoping that you will open your ears and benefit something. And if what you benefit has a way of interchanging with your belief system and bringing you to a particular kind of recognition and reality, so be it. If it does not, so be it. However, leader Olumba Olumba Obo has said often, often, I want to repeat this statement, that my coming has saved the world. That statement is so deep. It's deeper than the physical aspect of it generally known. It is deeper than the religious aspect. It is deeper than even the framework the organized framework of the BCS. That's an organized framework of BCS. Organized framework is what is perceived as the religious aspect. The religious aspect has to do with your daily activity of things related to church and all that. That statement is deeper than that. That statement encapsulates every existence in this planet. My coming has saved the world. Prof, I want to take note of this. Your Excellency, I want you to take note of it because we're not discussing here religion. We're talking about we're talking about something that is beyond our mundane religions. I have taken enough time to look into that statement, and I want to tell you what I have found out briefly in this opening speech. He said, "My coming has saved the world." If you look at that statement,
from the mental aspect of reality, he does not connote. How does his coming save the world? Who is saved? What, are the, what, what is the thing that saves the world? If you say because he, 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 he preaches love, somebody else will argue with you that oh, my church leader also preaches love. If you say because he has done this, that means there is something specific that has been done or, or, or that is done that can be precisely pinpointed as saving this planet. First of all, brothers and sisters, distinguished uh, audience, this planet has an orbit, this planet has an axis, this planet moves in the space. As you see us in this world now, whatever continent and country where you are, we are in the space. Our planet is in the space. It, 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 it is also on its own journey. It's going to somewhere. Now, someone comes into the planet and says, my coming has saved the entire planet. And those who know him very well know that he does not speak what, what um, the Sanskrit call prajalpa. That is things unwanted, frivolous talk. No. He doesn't talk anyhow, but when he speaks, it is specific. Those of you here, you know that far more than me. So in what way now has his coming saved the world? This must come to the attention of all the leaders of the nations in this world, all the scientists, all the um, religious leaders, and people of different fields of, en of endeavor. Because when that is well understood, you will now know why the coming of Olumba Olumba Obu has saved this planet. And I'm sure that some people hearing me speaking this maybe on the, uh, the air, many of them don't know that this kind of statement can even be made by me because I follow a different um, what were, you know, um, platform. Now, we have found out, let me tell you this, because we mentioned extraterrestrial. We human beings in this world, we are terrestrial beings. There are extraterrestrial intelligences at different levels in the cosmos. And according to classification, authentic, what we may call cosmological verdict, within that classification, there are 400,000 kinds of humanoids. 400,000 kinds. We human beings here on Earth, we human beings here on Earth, we represent just one kind, one species of Humanoids, humanoids, that is personalities or existences that has human form. You see, you know, when you see a tree, it's not a humanoid. Water is not a humanoid. But uh, when you say angel, archangel, all those kind of things, they are humanoids. Because they, at the end, no matter whether you see them with wings or whatever, you still see a human, a human face. Humanoid means what any existence that has a human face. And we have 400,000 kinds of humanoids in the universe. Now, these 400,000 kinds of humanoids, we human beings, we are on the physical realms of Earth. And being on the physical realms of Earth, we represent one species. The remaining species are scattered in different planetary systems. The Pleiadians, the Astutarians, the Draconians, all the different kinds of humanoids. Whether you see them in the religious format, uh, in the Bible, you, you read about angels, archangels, or watchers, cherubs, and this. That is what the Bible says. If you study the, the Veda, you hear about the Mahajanas, you hear, you, you hear about the Kumaras, the Kumaras, the Sananda, the Sanatana, the, the, the uh, Sanat, and all that. Even in the Quran, you hear about the jinns, you hear about the beliefs, you hear about um, angels. Even the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he, spoke, he mentioned that angels spoke to him. It was the angel that spoke to him to, to document the Quran. Now, all those, all those kind of existences are extraterrestrials. They are not in the physical order. They are beyond the physical order. And I want to tell you, they have been interacting with our planet at different levels. They know better than the human beings. Some of us now, who are also fortunate to have contact with such beings, they also help us to understand more 
of what is happening in our world. They help us to understand more of what leader Olumba Olumba Obu means when he says, my coming has saved the world. In gathering information, because if, 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 if you don't take anything home, take this statement home. My coming has saved the world. And I wish any, anybody anywhere can hear this, whether you are a president or, or, or whatever you are in this, in this planet. Because let, let me tell you, when any planet in the universe reaches to the point of poking into the atoms, that planet will stand upon what we call the threshold of winnowing. And I repeat, because we human beings here, we are like someone that his house is burning fire. Instead of making effort to put out that fire, he's busy chasing after rats. Even some people in the BCS, some of, of them don't even know where they are. That's the truth. They don't know where they are. Some are busy of that struggling after material things, materialism and others. Now, this universe, when any planet gets into the point of poking into the atoms, that planet, by law, what we are discussing here is by law, universal law, that planet automatically stands upon what we call the threshold of winnowing. And that is the point our planet has come to. When any planet comes to that point, it will either go left, I mean, it will either go right or left. Going left means that planet is destroyed. Going right means ascension. The planet ascends into a higher dimension of itself. It grows. According to extraterrestrial classification, our planet got into that system by the year, first week of July of the year 1964. But let's not go into that because that's, not, that's a different matter entirely. Now, we got there by poking into the atoms. When, we, when you poke into atoms, this thing we got, there are, there are many, many, many mysteries associated with atoms that are not known even in scientific terms. Even in scientific terms. Science knows that when atomic radiation occurs, it can affect the weather, it can affect the climate. But scientists, and I challenge, I, I say this categorically because it is an authentic extraterrestrial classification. No scientist in this planet knows that strontium 90 in the atomic device or the barrage of unstable uranium eh? via what we call slow neutron that it has consequences beyond the physical realm of earth into the sub subjective or the subtle aspects of the of the earth that information is not known and if it is not known in the earthly scientists how what about religion because what is happening now in our planet is that human beings look up to um, the, the government and the government looks up to science no one is looking up to God but according to higher extraterrestrial intelligences in the cosmos there are things will happen in this planet that everyone in this planet will look up to him and that's no, there's no joke about that God is not if before I came here I remember what an intelligence came we were discussing this is not a this thing. then he said People can go and preach anything you want to preach. Preachings have been concluded. Preachings are going on. No matter whatever knowledge you share, it is at a certain level. What will, nobody will have, nobody, they have no ear to hear. They, they will not hear. In this planet, here, yeah. what will make man in this world? What will make man eh, to bow by force? It's about to be played out. Is building up in all the astral regions of the, our planet. No scientist can contend with it. No president of any country will contend with it. No armament in this planet will contend with it. <laughs> and when it occurs, nobody will tell anyone. They say they don't tell a death that war has come. When you say war, this, I say, okay, don't worry. But you are, you, you are deaf. War comes. When the war comes, nobody tells anybody. This planet, this planet, you see this planet? This planet, this planet has come to the point of winnowing. Eh? When you say king of kings, lord of lords, 
Now, let me tell you. Do you see the nations of this planet now giving all the glory to that dimension as expected, as required? I don't see a big, a big rush in that dimension towards the glory that is required. But something will happen. There are so many things. There are things that cannot even be spoken of. I am telling you. But our planet has come to the point of winnowing. And at that point, as we poke into the atoms, we activated several things. Now, our planet was to be destroyed by multiple atomic radiation. And this constitutes the greatest danger in the planet. COVID-19, all those things happening now. This one, the, what you see happening now, is a warning shot. It's a warning shot. A warning shot. It will give birth to four stages of things. I mean, three stages of things. Because the warning shot is the first stage. Man must be prepared. I think we say we don't hear words in this world. <laughs> Uh, don't worry. We don't hear what, but we must hear. Because what has come on the planet now is, has, not, has not come to joke with anybody. It has come with a mighty force to tear asunder the third layer of darkness and to bring about something. And it will be seen by everybody. It's not that it is something that will happen only in the, in the, in the astral world, in the psychic world, in the inner realms, in the etheric system. No, no, no. On the physical realms of Earth, there is a build up of army in all the regions of the astral realms of Earth now, as I'm, I'm talking. And what is going to grip this planet overnight? What are you? Look at ordinary uh, COVID-19, how we are uh, panicking. We have been saying that is a warning shot. He that sits upon the throne, the fire that is on the throne, that we know as the king of kings and lord of lords. <laughs> ha. His patience is running out. Let's, let, let's leave that for now. Now, when a planet is destroyed in a solar system or in any system, that destruction puts that system in what we call a state of emergency. There are so many things that are not taught in our scientific, in our, in our scientific system that are not known, com completely unknown, even in religion. Religion doesn't know, or science, that if a planet is destroyed, all the, what we call the life stream of each soul, of each personality in that planet, because they have not completed the reincarnation cycle, they have to be, there will be an emergency evacuation to remove the life stream into another planet, into the subtle layer of another planet. For another planet to be formed for continuation of existence. It is not known. This has occurred once in our solar system. If you go, if you are aware as a scientist, or even by uh, our own studies, you hear of um, you hear of um, how many of you have heard about asteroid belt? Asteroid belt. You have heard about the asteroid belt. If you have heard about the asteroid belt, raise up your hand. Okay, you have heard about the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt eh, is orbiting between Mars now. It's orbiting between Mars and Jupiter now. The scientists tell, tell us that the asteroid belt is the leftover material in the composition of the solar system. Is that not what you read in the school? Intelligences beyond sciences, the extraterrestrials have made us to know that the asteroid belt is not the leftover material in the composition of the solar system. Rather, the asteroid belt is the debris of an exploded planet. Take note, the asteroid belt is the debris of an exploded, what? Now, give us your ear. The asteroid belt is the debris of an exploded planet. It took Professor Ovadin, a British astronomer, 25 years to go to the asteroid belt, bring back the debris 
conduct appropriate rap to, to establish that the asteroid belt is not the leftover material in the composition of the solar system, but the debris of an exploded planet via atomic radiation. So by the time that man started poking into the atoms here on Earth, like I have earlier mentioned, our science, our scientists do not know what we refer to as the subtle aspects of atomic radiation, especially as related to the barrage of unstable uranium, as well as strontium 90 in the atomic device. Now, this planet was put in a, on, a, on the path of destruction to be destroyed. It is known. It is known in the higher dimensions, because when you talk about intelligences in other words, you are hearing about personalities, some of them that their existence lies millions of years ahead of human beings. Some of them look at our, the greatest advancement we have in this planet purely as locomotive, locomotive science. Now, Leader, Olumba, Olumba Obo. This statement I want to make now is known in different higher units of reality. This statement was brought down to this earth eh, by what we know as the cosmic brotherhood of space masters. I'm sure that you have been hearing of a flying saucer. How many of you have heard about flying saucer? You have heard about it? You had even some story, many things going on. You heard about a, uh, um, F-27, Mr. Thomas, a pilot of, of American F-27, when the Pentagon discovered uh, something with very strange object in, uh, in American airspace, they sent forth a uh, F-27 uh, flight to go and intercept. What is this? The, the, the object, the spacecraft, you know, magnetized the, the, the American aircraft and took it away from our, 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 our planet onto this day. These reports are classified and they are in the, uh, in, the, in the Pentagon, and some of them are released, and some are not. So there are intelligences. Now, the information coming from the cycle of the cosmic brotherhood of space masters showed that leader Olumba Olumba Obo stood upon the asteroid belt, stood upon the asteroid belt, and issued a decree that the Earth planet will not be destroyed by atomic radiation. That decree issued by the sole spiritual head of the universe, great leader Olumba Olumba Obo, unknown to mundane men in their religions, in their politics, in their sciences, completely unknown to man in all aspects of his reality, but known to intelligences within the other higher dimensions, and brought and communicate, communicated back to the Earth planet through specific channels, which the one that is speaking here happens to know. Now, that became the basis of the rise of this planet. Without that decree issued, without that stand, without that manifestation, there has to be manifestation. Without that manifestation, and without what was done by him, this planet would have been destroyed like Maldek. Maldek was the planet destroyed that scientists say that it is a leftover material in the composition of the solar system. It is not true. Maldek, the debris of Maldek, which now became the asteroid belt, is the, is, is the, uh, the outcome of exploded planet. So whether you are, whatever you are in our planet, the coming, you have already benefited. Your benefit is not, your benefit from the coming of leader Olumba Olumba Obu is not limited to the physical system of your life, which is the camouflage. The physical body that you have is a body that you will live someday. It's not limited to the body that you, live, that you have here, this physical body that is the camouflage. It has saved the coming souls. It has saved the departed souls. That coming has that manifestation of leader Olumba Olumba Obu, not, but it's not a religious campaign. This is each point we are making here can be elaborated into so many dimensions with evidence, with so many things. 
with documentations of communications coming from higher planetary systems, from different points. So that coming is, is, is beyond the, the religious aspect that is generally known. It's far beyond the religious aspect. Sometimes people like us, if not for some reasons, may not even be interested in associating with the physical aspect of the religious aspect. Because the spiritual will eventually overwhelm and cause everything that is in this planet to fall in line. Everything must fall in line. Let me tell you, there was an intelligence that made communication to our planet from a section in Jupiter while it was vacating orbit into another system with this, 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 this spacecraft. That intelligence made a statement. I'm not going to mention the name of the intelligence, and I'm not going to um, say much about the, uh, the connectivity. But the statement states that we, we are committed. He's talking about the, uh, 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 you know, he's talking about a certain squad. He said they are committed in reclaiming this earth in light under the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obo. Listen, listen. The intelligence said that they are so much committed to this mission that even if it means man starting life again from the desert, something is going to happen on the earth. Something is going to happen on this planet. And when, that, and, and when what will occur occurs, say, they say, he said that they don't mind. Eh? Even if man will start life again from the desert, you know life in the desert? Where you trek to fetch water? You will not have all these amenities you have to enjoy? He said, even if, even if, it, is, even if, it, is, if it is so, that they are so committed to reclaiming this earth in light. Remember when the king of kings and lord of lords is mentioned in the Bible? Remember it is written that, that he leads the armies of heaven. Remember that. It is written that he leads the armies of heaven. That is, and the other side, let me also tell you briefly before I hand over this microphone to someone else. The other side, the side of Nakash, Nakash, the beast. I'm, I'm sure you have heard about the beast. Go and study the book of Daniel and, and see all that was written about the beast. The beast that, you know, the first beast, second beast, third beast, the fourth beast that even ended up having a, a, an eye, you know, has a small horn. The horn eventually grew, you know, and the horn eventually possessed an eye and a mouth speaking things. If you understand the chronology, if you understand the accurate understanding of those things, you will know that we, have, we are now at the last point, the last stage. Because that beast, that the, the, the fourth beast that has an eye and a horn and a mouth speaking great things, those horns and eyes metamorphose even as at the 96 AD, during the time that John had this revelation, into something else, into the, six, into the seventh head and the eighth that came out of the seven in the in Revelation chapter 17. Anyway, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we want to let you know that we are not here today to glorify any man. We are here talking about the mystery that has occurred, supreme mystery in our planet. And we are organizing a public lecture encapsulated in that mystery. And it is important that these things that are said are said. So that tomorrow, those of you that have come with me from different churches, because we belong to different churches, Your Excellency, you are welcome. We belong to different churches. Our man, His Excellency, is here, Dr. Donald Duke. Please be seated, Your Excellency. I remember one night I came to your house with Dr. Mbadinuju. Do you remember? <laughs> I came to your house. There. <laughs> okay. So Mbadinuju then was the governor of Anambra State. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are not here to glorify man. It is better anywhere you are. Try to know where you are. Otherwise, eh, you will be pursuing shadow. BCS is not a religion. Now, nah, which religion? If it's a religion, I will not be there. Did you know it? I am leading. <laughs> Let me tell you, we are leading a, a movement all over. We have a lot of network. If it's a religion, I will continue on my own. I will continue on my own. I'm sure the shepherd knows. <laughs> we have uh, so many problems, but in this BCS, 
is you have so many great, every manner of spirit you have ever thought of. Good. They are there. Bad. That is the truth. That is the truth. They are, they are, these are cosmic facts. So the other side, which you know as Nakash, is not resting at all. Why do they, in the first place, you know, establish astral centers in the astral world to possess scientists to poke into the atoms? Man does not know that they have a different project. Their project is to use atomic radiation to cause what we may call ubiquitous transmogrification and mutation of humans. So that the mutated consciousness of humans will only serve as a launching pad of greater battle in our solar system. Battles are going on in our solar system. Some of you are, who are aware of extraterrestrial contact and some of their history, some of you know about a, a war between Arthurians, Arthurians and the Pelagians, the, 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 the Draconians, the Arthurians join hand with the, with the Arthurians, join hand with the Pelagians, and they fought against another race of humanity known as Draconians, and it was a 600,000 old war. Let me tell you this now. For the past 28,000 years, you know, 28 million years, the 28 million years, our eight planets entered into this orbit, the, where it is now. This is not where it's supposed to be. It entered into this orbit for the purpose of accepting some limitation to harbor the humanoids coming from the exploded planet. Since 28 million years ago, that dimension of spirit we know as Olumba, Olumba, of the soul which has not stepped his foot on this planet. This is the first time when you talk about the soul spiritual head of the universe. This is the first time that that dimension of consciousness, of reality, that dimension of power eh, is physically manifested here on this planet. And I can stand anywhere in our planet, face any religious leader, face any scientist, because the fact we have even about science is beyond the mundane sciences. Extraterrestrial sciences is We can stand anywhere with facts to prove to any scientist, to anybody, why without is coming, this planet would have been destroyed. <laughs> so at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, use this opportunity to apologize to you for some of our guests that are not present. His Excellency Donald Duke is here. He is a senior citizen of Nigeria, and he knows some of the things I may point out now. We invited uh, Dr. Joseph Kabila, and uh, we also invited the, uh, the former president of um, Mozambique. They were all preparing to come. Though the former president of Mozambique, the letter I sent to him, I appreciated him for even accepting to come under a brief notice. But His Excellency Joseph Kabila was so much committed to come. And his personal friend, his old friend, Dr. Samson Mbugos, is here. When he arrived in Nigeria, our uh, people made him, for one, two reasons, he slept, he slept on a, on a, this thing at, the, at our airport. For certain reasons. And before he arrived, if not certain dimension of intervention, he wouldn't even be here. Before he arrived, for certain things I, I wouldn't want to go in. Some of you that watched TVC, you saw that that was TVC made a, a derogatory documentation about Dr. Joseph Kabila, I want to leave it for now. I'm sure that uh, His Excellency Dr. Duke will know if he's invited to Cote d'Ivoire to the United States and that area of the world, since a campaign of calumny is going on, I don't think you would like to show your face there. <laughs> so there were so, some last minute um, things that occurred, but what I want to tell you is that Everybody that is here now are the people that have been programmed by the Holy Spirit to be here. Finish. <laughs> so at this point, ladies and gentlemen, when this program was prepared, I was made to understand that 
um, we are not going to put, uh, if you look at that item where we are now, we did not say uh, chairman's opening speech, we say opening keynote welcoming address. And um, in line with some spiritual directive, divine directive, I want this book to be read because this book I want you to open your ear, especially those of you that are, that are from other churches, from other religions. Uh, even uh, Your Excellency Paxman. Uh -huh. We will open this book and read. This book is entitled Ineffaceable. That is divine lessons from the, from the, from the birth and childhood of leader Olumba Olumba Obo, as contained in the book entitled I Am That I Am by Pastor K. Ibasi. This, that particular material is now revised and abridged version for the third edition of Lida Olumba Olumba Obu Anna Public Lecture. I took that assignment of revising the material and abridging it for the purpose of presenting it here. Now, I would want to call upon somebody to come out and read this book. And that reading of this book is a part of the opening speech that we are having here before we go into lectures. I'm going to call on his, Her Eminence Glory into. I don't know if she's here. Is Her Eminence here? Oh, our beloved mother, please kindly come and read this material. As you conclude, it means we have concluded the, the opening speech. In other words, you and I are doing the opening speech. God bless you all. Give, give your ear, open your ears and listen and uh, benefit so that you will know why his coming has saved the world. The coming did not come from the sky. He has come here. And um, I also want to say this. Since the beginning of the world, OK, okay please, 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 His Excellency, uh, Dr. Jonah Duke, and um, a national leader, I'm sure you know, and one time governor of this state. You want to say a word here? Please, we welcome him with a clap offering. <laughs> Mama. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we formally welcome on stage the former governor of Cross River State. The man who beautified this city, and since his departure, this city has never been the same. Your Excellency, please, you have the floor. Give us a goodwill message on this auspicious occasion of the leader of Lumbo Lumbo Bu Anwar Public Lecture. We want to thank you because you graced this ceremony with your presence in our first lecture. Good to have you once more again. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I start, I would like to add my apologies to Dr. Sampson Burgos for, your, for the treatment that was meted out to you upon arrival in Nigeria. Sometimes we are overzealous and um, ignorant about so many things. I sincerely want to apologize to you, but the good thing is here. And please give my best wishes to Dr. Kabila. We met several years ago, and uh, we had lunch together at the instance of President Obasanjo while he was mediating in the crisis in the Congo. So again, I thank you for being here on his behalf. Um, I would like to give a message of goodwill to His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obu. Um, who has been a very great pillar of support and someone I have tremendous respect for and I've known him now for close to 30 years. Um, at the last public lecture, I gave an instance of the only meeting I was fortunate to have 
with leader Olumba Olumba Obu. And some of you may remember, it was quite an interesting meeting. Having said that, I want to also thank uh, Archbishop Ozoma for his very interesting um, insight into the cosmos. It's an incredible creation that we live in. We at best know a little speck of it. And mankind in their arrogance think they know everything. We are so ignorant of the environment in which we live in. And perhaps if we knew just 1% of what has been created, that knowledge is enough to make us go mad. So we're just given enough because we cannot contain it. So I really thank you for the lecture. In fact, while you were speaking, I was wondering how many of us, because I, don't under, I couldn't understand half of what you were saying, but <laughs> I want to be honest. <laughs> but, but that's the beauty of it. Um, from time to time, certain people amongst us are gifted with the understanding um, of this beautiful creation that we live in. And it's also very painful. And you know, when it is said, you will love God with all thy heart and love God with all thy might and love thy neighbor as thyself, truth is, there's absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing you can do for God but just keep harmony in his creation. And so when you're asked, love thy neighbor as thyself, do unto others as you'll have them do unto you, it's a universal truth. You're not doing it for God. It's only to show appreciation. You, you, you imagine it this way. You build a lovely home and you bring in people. They're not paying rent. You're not asking them to add a new block to the building. All you're saying is, I've given you this home. Just look after it. Make sure there's peace in the home. Don't quarrel amongst yourselves. Don't cheat, cheat, cheat each other. That's the only rent you're paying. Keep harmony in his creation. And of course, show appreciation. Love him with all thy heart and all thy might for what he has done for you. Even that, we human beings, it's difficult for us. You know, let alone adding a little bit of speck. Whatever you add, what if you build the biggest church? It's still the material that he provided that you have used in building that church. So there's absolutely nothing we can do for God but maintain his creation as an act of love towards him. I unfortunately cannot be here with you very long. I have to leave for a prior function of which I am chairing. If I were not chairing, I would stand that down and be here with you this morning. But I just wanted to say this. Um, our state, our nation, indeed the whole world, is in a very critical time. And I'm sure, um, Professor, you, you alluded to that in your, in your speech. This is not the only crazy place in the world. Cross River is not the craziest place in Nigeria, and Nigeria is not the cr only the craziest place in the world. The whole world is going through a cosmic turning point. And at the end of it, we will not be the same. But what will ensure that we survive it is our relationship with our Creator. It's very important at this time. We all agree that this is a cosmic change. Some people may call it end time. You can call it whatever you want, but it is at the end of it, we will not be the same again. I would like us to be more prayerful, to hold steadfast to our Creator, for our state, for our nation, for our continent, and indeed for the world. This COVID experience has taught us if we're ready to listen and discern from it, that we are one world, one people. If you decide that you're only going to vaccinate your people and leave the others unvaccinated, for instance, another variant of the disease will come and catch you. So, <laughs> it brings truth to the saying, love thy neighbor 
as thyself. You could be America. You could be the greatest country materially, not spiritually. And I'm glad he said something. There's a difference between religion and spirituality. Religion is a madman organization, right? So you have, but spirituality is totally different. Anyway, but if you think, you ask yourself, who is my neighbor? Everyone on this planet, everything created by the Almighty is your neighbor. So you have to treasure it and respect it. So if you think that you are materially more developed and you're in one part of the world and you don't care what happens in the other part of the world, COVID has taught us that it will catch you one way or the other. And therefore, we need to think deeply what it means to love thy neighbor as thyself. If you are that rich and this country is that poor, you need to help them because what comes around goes around. And COVID came around and is going around. So, this lecture series, and I like the theme, Unity in Diversity, also alludes to what I've just spoken about. As diverse as we are, we are one. Regardless of our race, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our beliefs in all this diversity, which is a beautiful thing. Can you imagine if the entire world was one race? It was so homogeneous, so monolithic, right? But the beauty of the races, the diversities, there's richness in it. But in all that diversity, we are one. And that is why the theme of this year's lecture is very, very important. If you look at it in the, with the background of global events, that in all this diversity, whether it's Korea, whether it's America, South or North, we are one. So remember, and this COVID thing is quite instructive. It started off, they say, in China. And before we knew it, it was a global phenomenon. But some rich countries felt that let's take care of our own and ignore the others. A variant came from South, well, I don't know if it came from South Africa, but it was analyzed in South Africa. And they quickly shut the doors around South Africa or Southern Africa. Found its way to Nigeria, found its way elsewhere, and before you knew it, it went global again. And right now, as we speak, I hear 177 countries have discovered that they have the Omicron virus. So a few countries decide that they will shut off certain countries. Don't come to my country because you have this virus. Sooner than later, they found out that it was a useless exercise. And they've opened it up again. In other words, what is it telling you? Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's all. Because what comes around goes around. You are as good as the least amongst you. As long as there are people who are inadequate, who are suffering, exists, you are not complete. Because the entire universe is one before the Almighty. And so, um, I would like to thank you for affording me this warm reception. I would like to urge you, please... And I know that this is being watched all over the world. I'd like to urge you and thank His Holiness for affording us this environment to discern, discern creation, as it were, the lecture series. I was here for the earlier one last year, and I hope to be here as often as it is held, because... <laughs> because it's a compendium of knowledge. And for me, life on earth is a school. From the day you're born to the day you transit, you are learning. You will learn, like every school, there are lectures or subjects that you like, and there are some that you do not like 
very much. I, was, I didn't like chemistry or mathematics at all. Um, but I liked history. The reason is that in history, none of us were there. So I can write and write and write and tell you all sorts of things. And one day, I wrote about 16 or 17 pages. You know, I took the history of Mali, took the history of Songhai Empire, took the history of Benin Empire, combined everything together and put it under Ghana. So <laughs> my teacher looked at it and he said to me, Donald, if you can tell me where you got all this information from, I'll give you 90%. If you cannot, I'll give you 40% for effort. I looked at him and I said, give me 40%, let me go. <laughs> So I like history a lot, but honestly, life is a school. And in this school, you, the test is coming out of it a better person and not a bitter person. Coming out of it a better person means that you have matured to the point where you see the oneness of humanity. That makes you a better person. But if you come out with the individuality, I, 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 this person did this to me, I, and you are, you're unable to forgive, then you have failed that school. Our prayer is that we all come out better people. So again, I really want to thank you for this um, incredible gathering, and I pray that we all come out better people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Please warm round of applause for His Excellency, the former governor of Cross River States, Donald Duke, for that beautiful goodwill message. We are one in the Lord. And there will be no division amongst uh, his children. We'll take the next item. Dr. Kezie, please. We appreciate the coming to our midst of His Excellency, Dr. Donald Duke. You know, a man that is handsome than many pretty women. <laughs> Your Excellency. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you have heard some words also from His Excellency. We are one. We are one. That is the higher realization. So at this point, we'll continue. Like I said, I'm handing over to the daughter of Zion, the daughter of the kingdom, her eminence, Glory Intuk. He will read for us, give us uh, the book he's going to read, has to tell us about the birth and early uh, childhood experiences of leader Olumba Olumba Obo, and then some few quotations from his words, his works, especially from the material, I am not God, but Olumba Olumba Obo, as well as my mission. God bless you all as you listen. Thank you very much, our able chairman. I want to acknowledge all our invited guests, distinguished brethren from the fold, men of the fourth rim and estate, our guest speakers and all, you're welcome. I'm asked to come here to present issues from this book and I'm going to try to do just that. We are talking about divine lessons from the birth and childhood of leader Olumba Olumba Obu, and we are starting from the prelude. This material is a presentation of the birth and early life of leader Olumba Olumba Obu in the world of man. Vital divine lessons are contained in this connection, hence the need for us to present same in this occasion. You may be aware that the womb of a woman is like a vehicle used to convert spirits, angels, and even God himself to the physical systems of reality. To this end, 
Our Lord Jesus Christ was born by a woman. Great prophets such as Moses, Elijah, Daniel, John the Baptist, and other biblical heroes were born by women. Great Vedic averters such as Krishna, Rama, Buddha, Kaitanya, and others were born by women. Other great prophets and masterminds such as Muhammad, Confucius, Guru Nanak, amongst others, were equally born by women. In our time, leader Olumba Olumba Obu was born by a woman. No one has ever descended physically from the sky to live amongst the earthmen. And leader Olumba Olumba Obu has often said that until doomsday, the Lord will not decide the same from the sky to establish his kingdom on earth. Now, having said this, we at this point present to this noble audience what, what we should know about the physical manifestation of leader Olumba Olumba Obo. This is based on the authentic publication of Pastor K. E. Basi in a book titled, I Am That I Am. This book is abridged and revised by His Grace, Archbishop Professor Ike Nathan Uzoma, our able chairman, for leader Olumba Olumba Obo annual public lecture 2021. From here on, let some records of Pastor K. Basi speak for itself. Special invitation. It was in December 1945 and schools had closed for Christmas holidays. I, Pastor K. Basi, had gone to pay homage to a family head in the Biakpan community. There, Prophet Enunpa, a surviving member of the Visioners Council in the community, sent word to me that he would like to see me that evening. We met at his house, and at the end of my visit, we agreed to meet again the following evening at about 7.30 p.m. The next day, before 7.30 p.m., I was already there, knocking at his door. And after a pause, I heard a voice saying, Kugure, which in Biakban means open. I opened and closed the door behind me and entered the dimly lit room. Prophet Mkpa raised the wick of his lantern, and the place became brighter. Avuma, meaning, have you come in peace? He asked me, Mvuma, I have come in peace, was the response. He then offered me a seat, and I sat down on the floor, flat curved wooden seat, or eke. He brought out a native plate, or it was made of calabash. The plate contained some quantity of unpeeled kola nut, igbo. There was another pot, Eze, containing bitter cola, yoguri, and he also brought out two native spoons, igori, and an animal horn of a medium size to serve as a cup, upe. There was no table as everything was placed on the floor. Then Prophet Enunpa prayed in the following words, God in heaven and on earth, we give thee thanks. I am following exactly the footsteps of my predecessors. I am admitting this, your son, into the vision of council. At the end of his prayer, he revealed the prophecy of the expected world divine leader to me. I was warned to keep it secret till the fullness of time. He served me the feast, one component after the other, and I, in turn, served him. Then we drank from the same cup. You will live to tell the story to the world. May he be with you, he concluded. Frankly speaking, I did not understand the significance of my being admitted into the Visioners Council. I forgot about it and left Biakwan for the western region of Nigeria in 1950. In October 1964, I returned to Calabar, and on the 2nd February 1965, I got baptized into Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. The late Pastor Lawrence Itam performed the baptism at Henshaw Town Beach, divine mandate. In October 1983, I fell terribly ill and at one stage became completely deaf. At night, leader Olumba Olumba Obo appeared in the spirit revelation and operated on me. He removed my hair and fingernails together with my skin and dumped them at a corner in my room. He brought out new skin, hair, and fingernails from a small bag and gave them to me to wear. Also, he breathed into my nostrils and put his two fingers into my ears and asked me to sit up. Finally, he removed his two fingers from my ears 
and I became once more a living soul. It is important to note that leader Olumba Olumba Obu, the ancient of days manifested on earth, and His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obu, the long-awaited Christ of the Second Advent, have healed several people in this manner, as testified by people from different parts of the world. The manifestations on earth is in fulfillment of the scriptures related to the coming of Jehovah God and his Christ, or God and the Lamb. Thus it is written, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And they shall be no more cursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. I had prayed as I was going to bed that night that I was really assigned to disclose, that Eva was really assigned to disclose the revelation concealed by the Visioners Council of the Biapan community, received about Lida Olumbo Olumbo both for several years preceding his birth, it should be revealed to me. I slept off and dreamt. In my dream, I found myself in a room sitting on a chair at a table writing. Suddenly, Lida Olumba Olumba Obo and Prophet Enunpa came in and sat directly opposite me. When I lifted my head and saw them, the two of them smiled and looked at each other. The leader gave a pen to the prophet who subsequently passed it to me. This pen was the old type called pen holder with a nip. I was very happy when I woke up, for it was there and then that I knew that this was the fulfillment, the fullness of time, and I had now been assigned to write the revelations. The prophetess of Biakman and her revelations. Prophetess Otom, the visioner, was the daughter of Onun Ogemele. She was married to Onun Egan Otomosim, but the marriage was not a successful one because Prophetess Otum had protested from the onset that she would not like to be given to, in marriage to anyone. She felt that with all its attendant problems and commitments, marriage would seriously affect her spiritual commitment. Her Parents were unhappy with her protest against marriage to Onunegan Otemesim and showed their displeasure. But by persuasion, a compromise was reached and, a marriage, and the marriage was contracted. For many years, there was no offspring because of her refusal to be intimate with her husband. After continual pressure from her husband, the prophetess eventually threatened him with divorce to enable her to serve God with devotion. This threat brought prolonged argument between husband and wife for some days, but once again, the matter was partially settled by the parents of both parties in a befitting traditional manner. One early morning, Prophet Tom woke her husband and narrated to him a revelation she had about the farm in her words. We were walking on our farm when we heard shouts coming from different directions. They were from other farmers also working on their farms who were drawing attention to oncoming animals. The animals turned out to be bush cows and you ran out with your special weaved net, upo, and a club, izai. A moment later, the bush cows started chasing people. Unfortunately, you were knocked down by one of them and later carried home dead. At home, all efforts to bring you back to life failed. She then pleaded with her husband not to lead the hunting expedition that was planned the previous night. She was afraid of what would happen because of the revelation. But her husband replied sharply, almost in anger, I have never been known to be a coward. My word has always been my bond. Even the smallest child knows eganotomism as eganotomism. Death is death and life is life. I cannot fear death. Failure to lead the hunting expedition as planned would be an act of cowardice on my part. The following day, Mr. Osam completely ignores his wife's divine revelation and led the hunting expedition as previously planned. However, some hours after they had started hunting, he was knocked down by one of the wild beasts and carried home on a stretcher, dead. As the news of his death spread, the people gathered and wept. 
While the weeping and wailing was going on, the two families of Egan and his wife were meeting to finalize some befitting burial arrangements for Ono Egan Otomosem to hold the following day. To many people then in Biakman and Varons, the death of Egan confirmed that Prophet Tom was indeed sent to them by God. This was to let the people know the efficacy of her revelations and visions, which in the future would reveal so much to a doubting world. During the night following the day that Egan died, something spectacular happened. Prophet Tom was weeping alone in her room. Every attempt to console her had failed, but she eventually dozed off due to fatigue. Consequently, she had a spectacular revelation. She later recounted her revelation experience thus. As I was fast asleep, an ele elegant young man dressed in white, simple white clothing appeared to me smiling and said, Weep no more, Prophet Osotan. Your husband is not dead. He is alive. The young man got hold of my forehead and helped me make three circles of O, O, O on my husband's dead body. One O on his forehead, one O on his abdomen, and one O on his right knee. After this exercise, the young man disappeared, and I woke up to see my husband opening and closing his eyes and mouth at short intervals. I watched him raise his hands one after the other very gently, and then he turned his eyes to my direction where I was sitting and watching, but he couldn't recognize me. He struggled to get himself into a sitting position, but failed. It was at this stage that I went and helped him to sit up. After a while, he fixed his eyes on me and called me by name, Atom. Are you Atom, my wife? I answered in the affirmative. He then asked, where am I? What am I doing here? I narrated the events that led to his being there. He wept, and I joined him in weeping. As we were consoling and embracing each other, we heard a knock at the door. It was my father. Ononogimele, and it was the first knock at that early hour. He almost collapsed when he saw the outstretched hands of my husband trying to embrace him as I swung open the door. Stop! Don't embrace me. I'll have nothing to do with a ghost. We shall give you a befitting burial. You were a great hero. We all know this, screamed my father, pointing his walking stick at a gun who was standing motionless, staring back at him. I fell on my knees, weeping before my father, holding firm his feet. Father, what you are seeing is my husband again, my real husband, not his ghost. Ogumale dropped his walking stick, and the two men embraced each other. That early morning drama drew the attention of few passers-by who formed a small crowd at the, as the news of the resurrection of Egan started spreading. The ordinary had happened. Those who heard the news could not believe their ears. Everyone wanted to see Egan with their own eyes and to know more about the mystery man who had brought him back to life through the mysterious inscription of O-O-O, Olomba, Olomba, Obo. Arrangements for the burial had now been overtaken by event, and while a cross-section of the community were overwhelmed with joy at the amazing news, there were some disgruntled elements led by the necromancers sorcerers and witch doctors. They quickly held series of meetings with people in the community, telling them not to believe the story of prophetess uh, Otomegan Otomosim. To this end, the community began, became divided on this matter. Thus, prophetess Otom and her resurrected husband were summoned to the palace of the king. At the palace, Ononopia Etoti stood up when the couple took their seats. He was an intelligent man who had acted for the king, Onunegimedu, on several occasions. He was the king's spokesman when serious matters are brought to the palace. The meeting took the form of a small court session with Opia for the prosecution. The interrogation ran as follows. Prophet Tom, everyone in this community was seriously disturbed by events in your husband's house the other day. Where were you? Were you aware? Prophetess answered yes. Amongst other things, you said that the resurrection of Egan, your husband, 
was as a result of three circles, O-O-O, in your revelation made by a mysterious man. Could you confirm the story? That is a true story. Could you tell us what this man looked like in your revelation? Professor, Prophetess Otom then narrated the story of the man, how he looked, and the miracles he had performed in her revelation to the anxious audience who were held spellbound by her account. Did this your man tell you his name? Yes, he said his name, Arogosuren, uh, the word of God, Etuk, the way, Kakarok, the truth, Anima, love. Did this your man know that you would be subjected to this series of questioning? She replied, if he did not know, why did he furnish me with the answers I've given you? The palace council members then consulted each other for a brief moment and came out with this statement. You can go with your husband. You may be re-examined any other day. They left the palace much more respected. Knights of Revelation. Prophetess Atom returned home with her husband from the king's palace full of thanks to God. As a token of appreciation to God who had sent the mystery man that had brought a gun back to life through the inscription of OOO, she declared for herself seven days of fasting and prayer. Three days to the end of this period, Prophetess Atom had series of divine revelations. She was so disturbed after the third night's revelation that she decided to tell her revelations to the king the following day. She arrived at the palace early enough to be among the first sort of people to meet with the king, Onunegim Edo. Word had reached the Onun that morning that Prophet Ezotom wanted to see him, this time in private. He ordered that she be ushered in. She made the usual traditional greeting, knelt before the king and narrated her revelations of the past three nights to him as follows. The first night, I saw in my revelation many people in white, both male and female, young and old. Some of them had beards and wore white garments. Some were white in complexion, some were black, tall and slim. They sang many songs in different languages that I could not understand. Those in Biakman ran thus, English translation. The Almighty Father is making his physical appearance here on earth. He will come like the fire. He will come like the storm. He will come like the thunder. All power in heaven and on earth have been surrendered to him. There is great joy, joy in heaven and on earth. The people sang and danced around the town. Some of the onlookers were moved to join them and dance too. The revelation of the second night came with a warning thus. Everyone should refrain from all manner of sins and wickedness. There should be no more prostitution, stealing, making of charms, or worship of demons, hates, and bearing grudges. A man should marry only one wife. Witches and wizards are vanquished. The only power in existence is God, the creator. Then the revelation of the third night took a different turn. It was the day of the introduction of the greatest God of gods, the Almighty Father. At the village square, many people had gathered. They sang and danced continuously, knocking their heads on the ground from time to time. All of a sudden, silence descended over the whole earth. But this silence was broken by flashes of lightning, deafening, deafening thunder, and a rushing wind that brought torrential rain. This was to herald the next event, namely the arrival of the Almighty Father. No one was left in doubt as to who he was. When he finally arrived, he walked straight to his elevator seat that was fully decorated. Everyone I saw in this revelation was on his or her knees. And when he finally took his seat, he too knelt down and knocked his forehead on the ground. After a while, he stood up and addressed the gathering in many languages, including Biakman. The king then caught him. What did he say in Biakman? And the prophetess answered. He said that his coming has saved the entire world from imminent destruction. He also said that the manner of gathering demonstrated would ever continue on earth. At last, as narrated by the prophetess to the king, the Almighty Father waved his hands to the audience as he was leaving them, and the audience reciprocated. Persecution. The king was greatly touched by the revelations of prophetess Atom, but as she left the palace, 
he warned her not to tell the revelations to anyone until after he had consulted his advisors. Before leaving the palace, however, the prophetess delivered a counter warning to the king, Onunagimedo, that should the people fail to adhere strictly to the instructions in these divine revelations, your kingdom will fall and be taken away from you. The warning of the prophetess was not taken kindly by the king. Rather, he saw it as an insult to his throne. Consequently, he immediately summoned his advisors, along with other personalities in the community, including the sorcerers and witch doctors, to his palace. Addressing those assembled, he wasted no time with a preamble, being far too angry for that. He told them, most of you must have heard that prophetess Tomaganotemesim, the daughter of Enunogemele, met with me this morning. I am sure that you are here, you all here are eager to know the outcome of that meeting. There was unanimous affirmation from those assembled. The king then went on to inform them of the outcome of the meeting, of his warning to her to conceal the revelations and her counter warning to him concerning the fate of his kingdom should the instructions in the revelations not be heeded to. The council did not take kindly to the counter warning from prophetess Autumn and called for her to be brought to the palace. Some even demanded that only her head be brought. There was greater uproar, but finally she was sent for and brought before those who were to determine her fate. The prophetess was ordered to tell her story to the council spokesman and after repeating it, they had to agree that the revelations could no longer be regarded as secret. That notwithstanding, the council concluded that she should not be set free because of her so-called insults to the king and community by her threat. They concluded that a suitable punishment for this would be made public the following day. As for the revelations, the council maintained that those were mere imaginations for a small mind and that no one should take them to be serious matters. They held that the issue should be regarded as closed, at least for the time being. The next day, a town crier was sent out to announce to the whole community that Prophetess Sotome Ganotumasim was thenceforth ostracized for insulting the king, Onunagim Edo. It was announced that she was not to associate with anyone in the community and no one was to associate with her that anyone found contravening this order would be severely punished. Seven barren days, years, sorry. Three days after the decree and without waiting for any repeal, Prophetess Autumn cleared herself of these false accusations. She declared her innocence by robbing herself with native chuck and dancing around the town, talking to as many people as she met on the streets. She danced to the tune of her own chorus, which goes thus, you rogues, you wicked people, full of evil thought, people who do not wish others well. How do you expect good things to come your way? Imagine you saying I should not talk to people. How many people have you created since the world was made? Continuing to dance around the town, she announced a further revelation to the entire community. She proclaimed that the worst was yet to befall them for failing to strictly adhere to the divine revelations from the Almighty Father, the honor of the universe, the word of God, the way, the truth, and love. She specifically proclaimed saying, the honor of the world has directed that henceforth there will be confusion among the king's advisors, the necromancers, and juju priests. He has ordered that as a punishment for your disobedience, for a period of seven years from now, no woman will become pregnant, and therefore, there will be no birth, neither will there be any death. In addition, the king of Egemedo has fallen, and his kingdom is taken away from him. There will be a famine, and the yields from the farms will continue to be disappointing for each succeeding year. The announcement, this announcement threw the community into confusion. Questions came from all sections of the community. Who is the owner of the universe? Who does she refer to the Almighty Father? Prophetess Ogum, Otum, would reply. The one who is called the word of God, the way, the truth, and love. 
But still, the people argued that it was all too incredible. At this point, the prophetess would tell them to wait and see. One year after the divine declaration made by the prophetess, no conception, birth, or death was recorded in the community. There was alarm and confusion everywhere. The king looked at his advisors for a solution. Some people in the community asked the king to appeal to the prophetess to speak to her God that he might have a change of heart. Like Pharaoh of ancient Egypt, the king didn't change his mind and the prophecy continued to be fulfilled. Prophetess Atom was silent all the while. After exactly six years, the unexpected happened. Prophetess Atom broke her silence with another revelation. She announced to the community thus, the land has been defiled. The remaining one year of the seven years will be used for the mortification of the flesh to enable us all move to the promised land. There the Almighty Father, as the Son of God, man, will be born on earth in our midst to the family of Olomba. Because of the unfolding of her revelations, people were, very, were now very eager to hear more of her, of her divine messages. The first day of the seventh year fell on AK or Market Day. The following day is usually Ibum. From Ibum to Ikwa is seven days, and these seven days were declared fasting days. Each family was ordered to conduct its own fasting, and this went on throughout the community with all seriousness. At the end of the seventh year, the great exodus began, and true to the revelation, the king, Onunegemedu, did not return to the promised land as a real king, because the regalia and paraphernalia that constituted the kingship was not found intact. By tradition, no king without the complete relics had ever been regarded as a true king of Biakpan. A year after the arrival of Biakpan people to the promised land, women began to give birth to children in fulfillment of the revelation given by, the God, by God to prophetess Otomegan Otomosim. The revelations of prophet Enunpa, popularly known as Asebereti, prophet Enunpa was a human achiever a spectacular human being who did not forget events once they were registered in his memory. He was one of the greatest historians of his time, a gifted dreamer and visioner. He was the oldest man in Biakman, reaching over 110 years before he passed on in 1970. Mpa was the man who, become, who became the custodian of all the records about young Olomba before and after his birth which he passed on to me, Pastor K. Ibasi. These records were handed over to Prophet Enunpa by Prophetess Otomegan Osum. Prophet Enunpa, Enunegan Otomosum and Enunegela were the first members of the Visioners Council, which was headed by Prophetess Otom. One night after falling asleep, Prophetess Enunpa had a revelation wherein he saw the roof of his room split open and a ball of light descending into the room, growing even larger and brighter. It finally perched on the wall, and he heard a voice saying, Go and inform the family of Olumba that the word of God by name, Olumba, Olumba, Obo, will be born into their stock. The child will rule the world with an iron rod. The world will reject him as an imposter, but he is saved by all the angels and he will lead the world with love. Go, be not afraid, for I am with you. When the prophet woke up, his room was very bright, and the message was still ringing in his ears, quite audibly. As he came out of his house, the first cock crewed, and the ball of light was right before him. He knew and felt strongly that the divine power of God had taken control of him. According to him, as I moved forward, the ball of light moved. It became my guiding light. When I entered Akbotam, the forest between Imenyo and Onorowanza village, I felt like easing myself, so I stopped. Amazingly, the ball of light stopped too. The unusual thing was that in this forest was a strange sound that shook the forest 
as though great animals were fighting among themselves or some people were felling huge trees. To my astonishment, when I moved forward, the whole place became as quiet as the graveyard. When I arrived at Anobo's compound, I discovered that the family were discussing the same revelation that I had, the one which had brought me to see them. Prophet Enunpa recounted how a delegation was then dispatched to the residence of Onunpa Obashi, to whom I, it was revealed by Prophet Mpa that he would later have a daughter who should be called Ibum. She, as a virgin, will conceive and give birth to the holiest of the holies, Olomba Olomba Obo, who would make his physical appearance into the world of man through Biakwan. The name, the name Ibumba, would consequently be remembered throughout the length and breadth of the universe. Furthermore, in another revelation, Prophet Enunpa said, I was sitting on Ukwe, a tree trunk on which people sit to relax from time to time. On that fateful evening, when I heard a voice saying, get up and go home. I left immediately for my house, and as soon as I arrived, I felt as if I was drugged. I went to bed and immediately closed my eyes and slept. Suddenly, I found myself at the stream, Edu, and it was bright day light. Many people were taking their birthday. All of a sudden, it started to rain. The rain did not last, and the weather soon became clear again. Then, there was another shower, even though the sun was still out. This was followed by Anegen Namekuen Agure, meaning strangers are descending from above. I looked up, and behold, the heavens opened, and many steps all joined together were lowered down. The multitude that followed could not be counted. The step descended with the people who were dressed in immaculate white, and in their midst was a woman with a wrapped child in her arms. The people were singing and dancing, and I heard the sounds of trumpets. As the steps touched the ground, many people gathered to receive those arriving from above. They searched forward to take a glimpse of the child and the greatest woman amongst women. A voice was repeatedly saying, Abrikutmi inana. This means, touch him not, for he who is from heaven is holy. I heard a chorus singing, Ukwok, ane yenguguruma, me anotom, me amezemzem, ishima ane yengut, ane yenganarama, meaning the ruler of the universe has arrived with his angels. Peace. Peace is bestowed on the entire world. The world had been salvaged. This was followed by another voice saying, Anabakut, akomema mengun anara. Anabakut, ntenema akomangud atak. This translates as, those who will hearken to his voice shall be saved, but those who will not hearken to his voice shall perish. I was then disconnected and woke up. Supreme power manifested. Leader Olomba Olomba Obo's parents were peasant farmers who loved themselves dearly. They practiced love, peace, forgiveness, and all other godly virtues which people knew and attested to. None of them was a stumbling block to the other in any form of life. They were always at the service of their fellow human beings. Leader Olomba Olomba Obo's earthly mother Queen Mother Ibu Malumba was always a source of inspiration to other women. She was a born leader who would forgo her food and sleep to attend to those who needed her services, even in the darkest night. Often, she would be accused of being liberal to a fault, but since this was her nature, she could not help being liberal. A devoted religious woman in practical Christian terms, she knew that she could reap her reward from God who rewards according to one's services. On the 30th, 30th of December, 1918, she finally gave birth to the promised Holy One, Alomba, Alomba, Obu. Now, it happened at last that leader Alomba, Alomba, Obu, 
was only four days old when he alerted the world that he was no ordinary child. Four days after his birth, he manifested the supreme divine power by restoring sight to a blind woman called Honori Ekeko, fondly known as Akeko. She was not born blind, but mysteriously lost her sight when one morning she woke up to find herself blind and had remained so for many years. On that glorious morning, Akeko had taken her bath and was on her veranda sharing jokes with some well-wishers when the news came of the feast of a, a newborn child called, called Uvum in Biakpan language. This feast is usually conducted eight days after the birth of a child. But on this occasion, it was only four days on the advice of the Visioner's Council. Akeko immediately called for her guide to take her to pay homage to the newborn baby. On arriving, she called out, Jarane Kanari Kana, Jakme, meaning, where is that our visitor? Where is he? Having put down her walking stick, she asked to be shown the child and was helped into the room. She stretched out her hands, desiring to have a feeling of the child. Someone placed him in her arms. Immediately, she gripped the baby. She shouted, what's a thing to happen in your life? People of Biakman, this is truly a wonderful child. Oh, you look so plump and healthy. Miraculously, Akeko's sight was restored as soon as she touched the child, leader Olomba Olomba Obo. The people present were bamboozled as they looked at each other in amazement. Akeko then tried to carry the baby away in great joy, but she was prevented. She leaped out of the house, shouting and dancing joyfully, embracing everyone she met. It was a wonderful morning, and the people glorified the God of heaven and earth for the miraculous healing. Essence of forgiveness. Young Olumba was aged four when a surprising incident happened. He was playing with his friends in the village when some birds flew by and dropping from one of them landed on his hand. His friends laughed at him for what has happened. But without taking any notice of them, she looked skyward for a moment, then, with a smile, said, meaning, the bird shall soon come to apologize. Some people passing by were attracted by what he said. They laughed and mocked the young boy, saying that such a thing was not possible. But a moment later, the bird flew back and perched on his hand. He then took hold of it and stared straight into its face as though they were engaged in deep conversation. After this silent encounter, he allowed the bird to fly away. When asked why he did not use the bird to wipe the mess off his hand, he responded, he responded That is, when one has apologized for what he has done, what else would you want the one to do? A lesson on patience. One day, while playing with his mates, the young Olumba became thirsty. As luck would have it, he saw a woman returning from the stream with a vessel of water. He approached her and asked for some water to drink. The woman replied that unfortunately, she didn't have anything for him to drink from. Young Olumba then turned round and plucked a green leaf, which he turned into the shape of a cup. The woman poured some water into it, which she drank. He was not satisfied, so he asked for more, and the woman obliged. The third time, he requested for more, and once again, the woman saved him willingly. This time, he only sipped it and said to her, woman, I do not want to waste your water. Drink this. He gave the remaining water to her, and without hesitation, she took it and drank. By this time, a crowd had started to gather, and he said to the woman, your patience has saved you. Having exhibited patience, you are no longer barren. 
go home and tell your husband the good news. The woman was shocked, and those who had witnessed the events were confounded. That evening, she went to see young Olumba's earthly father and reported the incident to him. He responded saying, I am always afraid of that, my child. If he said your womb is blessed, then it is so. A few months later, the woman became pregnant and went on to become the mother of many children. She and her husband had, become, had come to settle in Biakban from a neighboring village as farmers, and for 11 years, she was barren. There was great joy when she eventually returned to their village as parents, blessed with children by the spoken word of leader Alumba Alumba Obo, who was then a baby in the human terms. Mercy to a sinner. Mr. Obutu was shot dead by a man who suspected him of having illicit affair, illicit sex with his wife. The incident happened in the forest where he was hunting. His assailant had shadowed him there to commit the crime. After two days with no sign of Mr. Obutu's return, search parties were sent out to find him. One such party found his body dumped in a pit and carried it home. Necessary preparations for burial were made and relatives with sympathizers were weeping and wailing. This was going on when young Olumba walked in. He asked why they were weeping and they told him what had happened. With a smile and full of mercy, he responded, weep no more for the savior has arrived. Sh shocked by the statement, everyone became silent. He went into where the corpse was laid, and to those watching over it, he said, Be witnesses unto the Holy One who has come to serve the world. He then shouted at the top of his voice, Obutu! 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 Venavarem! Ovenenyesukuren! This means, Obutu! 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 Wake up and serve your God! Mr. Ubutu immediately came back to life. He woke up and sat down, looking dazed. The young Olumba then questioned him. Abano Ubutu or who is standing before you? To this question, Mr. Ubutu replied, Mawo, meaning it is you. Still only aged four years, the young Olumba told the shocked audience, Ubutu has come back to save his God my God, and your God. Before leaving, however, he seriously warned Mr. Obutu to refrain from adultery. Tremendous div divine fate. In 1924, another miracle was performed by young Alumba, which shocked the entire neighborhood. News had spread that a woman died in labor and was lying dead at an occult compound in Anurwanza, one of the settlements that make up the community of Biakwan. The compound was that of, of Chief Ekoropanekot, the land chief of Biakwan, an important figure in the community who presided over all issues related to the land and its uses. Young Olumba was at the playground with his playmates when he overheard a group of people discussing the woman's death. He told them that the woman was being tried in a court in the rims beyond and could be brought back to life if he would be allowed to minister to her. When this information reached the ears of the dead woman's relatives, they became confused as to the authenticity of the statements. But since the woman, the life of the woman was paramount, they wasted no time in pleading for young Olumba to be allowed to minister to the dead. On hearing what was to happen, Olumba's earthly father seriously objected considering his age. He felt the boy was too young to be taken to such a place where a woman died while giving birth. But leader Olumba Olumba Obo thought differently. He told the anxious spectators that his earthly father or mother had little or no, no power over him. Rather, he said he was waiting for a green light, of course, from within him to go ahead. On finally receiving the green light, he went straight to the room where the woman was lying dead and requested that the room be cleared of people. This having been done, 
he prayed fervently thus I was a sockum Guaremayena Remazoi Adratayen Onawana Egwerai Kerai Yenabu Obe Remavuna Igegavuna meaning my father who art in heaven the creator of heaven and earth you said that this woman is not dead but asleep wake her up instantly the dead woman came back to life although many were delighted at this tremendous divine feat but some wondered whether olumba olumba obu was actually a human being they knew that the dimension of the demonstration of his divine power by mere spoken words is completely beyond man's traditional scientific occult or religious recognition to those who question the miracle he performed he would say i am not the one doing but the holy spirit one of those not happy with all these was chief okorokwanekot in whose compound the dead woman was raised to life because he wasn't present his advisors who would always brief him on any important event during his absence recounted the story contrary to what they had expected the man criticized those who had allowed young olumba into his compound it so happened that the resurrected woman was actually chief or caught slave one night when in the forest while returning from a hunting trip he had found her tied to a tree according to him she had been left there as a sacrifice to appease the wicked gods of her village he brought her home as a slave and called her Unyangagam, literally, my gift. To him, it was not spectacular news that his slave had been brought back to life. In fact, he was jealous of the raising, rising fame of young Olumba in the neighborhood and exclaimed, Who is this young Olumba who will not allow me to have a sound sleep in my house? Today it is Olumba. Tomorrow it is Olumba. Tell him I do not want to hear such news of him in my land anymore. Enough is enough. Things like these are expected because not everyone appreciates God or what comes from God. Dealing with the faithless. Some weeks after the above events, young Olumba went on a ministry to two settlements within Biakman. At the first of these, Imenyo, it was a market day, and he soon became surrounded by those who had heard of his miraculous feat? Someone asked him, are you a human being? He replied, if I'm not a human being, what do you think I am? Another man attempted to ask him a question, but a stranger from Aruchuku pushed his way through the crowd to question him thus. Are you a lumber? He confirmed he was, and the man continued, your fame has spread to other neighboring villages, but no one can believe the stories. I do not believe them either, as I'm standing before you because you are too young to perform such miracles. Young Olumba looked at the man steadily for a brief moment and then called him by name, saying, You are the only surviving child of your mother's womb. Your wife, Ariakosia, had given birth to nine children, five boys and four girls. Two of the girls and one of the boys have returned to Mother Earth. Am I right? The man slumped down almost immediately. The man slumped down, almost fainted. To this end, a man from the crowd asked him if all that the young Olumba said was tr were true. Anoa had replied that everything was true and all were amazed. That day, the faithless became the faithful. His true identity. From Emenyo settlement, the young Olumba moved to Amibit, where he met Chief Anoiko, alias Aselbe Ono, as he was coming out of his compound, Ono Biaja. The boy went to Chief to give the chief the traditional greeting, meaning, Father, I greet you. The man responded, addressing him by name and asking, 
as to his health and added, is your father at home? But young Olumba did not reply. At this point, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, as a boy, made a very astonishing and amazing statement, which confounded all those that were there. He said, I have nothing to do with the man you call my father. I am the word. I mean the word that created everything in heaven and on earth, including the man you call my father and you. Chivuno Iko asked, including me? Yes, including you, came the response, adding, everything created, every created thing obeys me because I am the word. The chief was lost for words, and all he could say was, it's all right, my son. It may be recalled that leader Alumba Alumba Obo has made it known in his divine teachings that the Almighty Father is the Word, that Christ is the Word, and that the Holy Spirit is the Word. At that moment, the young Alumba saw some kites flying above and said, even the kites obey me. They are my messengers in response Someone in the crowd said, even indeed they obey you as you claim. Do something to prove your authority over them. On hearing this challenge, young Olumba beckoned to one of the kites saying, I want to send you on an errand. The kite then descended from the sky and perched on his head. Go and bring me a chicken, but do not harm it, he ordered. The kites flew off and a few minutes later returned with the chicken as asked. Young Olumba took the chicken, examined it, and seeing it was not harmed, took the kite to return it to, told the kite to return it to where it had found it. The kite did so, and then still came and reported back to Olumba. Many who witnessed this divine feat were amazed, as usual. People were still looking at the young boy in amazement when he stopped a hunter who happened to be passing by, returning from a hunting expedition. What have you got in your bag? He asked. A dead monkey, replied the hunter. Young Olumba ordered the hunter to bring out the monkey. He took the dead animal from the hunter and flung it into the nearby bush. The monkey jumped from one tree branch to another and finally entered into the deeper forest. Turning to the hunter, he asked if he was annoyed. Yes, he said, to which young Olumba responded. Go to your compound and you'll see a young lady who died some hours ago. She has now come back to life because the monkey has also come alive. Don't you know that whenever you kill an animal anywhere or at any time you have killed a human being? As this, as this was going on. Some members of Olumba's family turned up, having traced him to Emibit village. They had come to take him home, for it was now evening. Olumba's earthly parents tried to persuade their son to go to school, but he refused. However, he later obliged and went to school, but stopped in Standard 3. He had earlier told them that he had no need of human education, reminding them of his first comprehensible statement met at the age of three, when he said, call me teacher and master. I am the universal teacher. By 1925, his statement had already, was already coming to pass as he had gathered enough followers to start his divine mission, namely the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, because of the spiritual services he was rendering to the community and the people, he did not have enough time to concentrate on his schoolwork. But the few years he spent in schooling, just to make his earthly parents happy, he was noted by his teachers to be extremely brilliant with supernatural knowledge. And in all, most cases, he taught his teachers, correcting them when they go wrong while teaching their students. Conclusion. Distinguished audience, what leader Olumbo Olumbo Bu has done in our world in this age and time unto this day are too numerous to mention. 
He has often made it clear that Jehovah God and his Christ are physically manifested on earth in our time in fulfillment of the ancient biblical prophecies. To this end, we have in our midst the sole spiritual head of the universe, the Holy Father, leader Alumba Alumba Obu, and His Holiness Alumba Alumba Obu, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, with their presence on earth, the kingdom of God will surely reclaim our planet to the light of heaven. His Holiness Alumba Alumba Obu, the King of Kings and Lord of, and Lord of Lords, is currently leading the host of the forces of light in the universe towards the permanent establishment of peace, of love, and righteousness on earth. Furthermore, the Holy Father, leader Alomba Alomba Obo, categorically stated that the time will come on earth via unprecedented upheavals when every human on earth will know that the brotherhood of the cross and star is truly the long-awaited kingdom of God. Meanwhile, leader Alomba Alomba Obo often explained that brotherhood stands for the unity of God and his creation. He's, he also explained that cross is a symbolic term of bearing the burden of others in love to the glory of God. While star, in his divine term, is the glory of the Holy Spirit, bestowed on those that patiently carry the cross. Thus, the kingdom of God on earth has no better name than the brotherhood of the cross and star. Also, leader Alomba Alomba Obo made it clear that the name Alomba Alomba Obo is the highest name of the Most High God, as well as the new name of God, which our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. What this holy name has done and is doing all over the world is a matter of another day. But suffice it to say that Whoever puts all his trust in this name will never be defeated in both the journey and battles of life. Distinguished friends, guests, ladies and gentlemen, whether or not we know it, the entire human race now live in the era of God. The things said to unfold in our world, the battle that will end all battles amongst the host of other things can't be imagined. Presently, we, the people of this world, are like a man whose house is on fire. But instead of making effort to put off the fire, he is busy chasing after rats. The Holy Spirit alone, via the new name of Jehovah God and his Christ, Alomba Alomba Obo, is our last hope in this world. PB to you all. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. for now and evermore. Thank you very much. Beautiful. 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 Give a standing ovation, please. Stand up. That is a, a rendition by excellence. She deserves it. I think at this point, what is normally said that when you want to hide an information from a black man, you should hide it inside a book. So instead of hiding it inside the book for you not to read it, we read it for you to hear it. So now, it has pricked your curiosity. You will now find time to study all that has been put together about the history of the man we are celebrating today. At this point, before we bring in the next speaker, as everything has been fulfilled, he's the one. Everything has been fulfilled. That chorus should be rendered, please. Call the name. We invite our brother Wisdom Omini to please step forward and take a few minutes of entertainment. And that will also herald us to the arrival of our father, His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obu, now and forevermore. Oh, amen. Oh, 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 oh. 
Amen. Oh, oh, oh Amen. Everything is fulfilled. Ah, amen. Oh, oh, oh. stand, please. Hey, oh, oh, oh. Ah, amen. Oh, oh, oh. Amen. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, 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 amen. Oh, 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 amen. Oh, 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 amen. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, oh, amen. Oh, oh, amen. Oh, oh, amen. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. The prophecy is fulfilled. The prophecy by John divine is fulfilled in a time. Everything is fulfilled. The prayers which our forefathers long expected them pray for. The new kingdom of God is here. Jehovah God in his crisis, yeah. Prophesying is fulfilled. Oh, everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. The time of Elijah has passed. The time of Deborah has passed. The time of John the Baptist has passed. Time of Esther has passed. This is the era of leader on the bar, on the bar who reigned from pole to pole, from strength to strength, from generation to generation. It's red. He will reign. He will reign in all planets. He will reign in everywhere. He will reign. He will reign. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, amen. Oh, amen. Oh, amen. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. It was written that the time shall come. No man would teach a brother to know God. I tell you, a father will not teach a son to know God. A son will not teach a father to know God. From the least to the greatest who know him. This is the time. This is the time. This is the time. We must know God. This is the time. Alimbang is training. Alimbang is training. All over the world. Amen. 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 Oh, everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Everything is fulfilled. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, warm round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Everything has been fulfilled. Distinguished brethren, we are expecting the arrival of our father, who will be here with us any moment from now. And after that, we will take the main lecture uh, proper, and we'll continue with the proceedings of this public uh, lecture. Distinguished brethren, may we all please rise. As we are now in the Holy Entrance, our Father, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we 
Thank you, Father. Our dear Father, we most humbly welcome you to this auspicious occasion. At this point, we want to kickstart the protocols for the Father's arrival. May I invite The choir master for the one for four virgins to so please lead us in the rendition of the Brotherhood of the Crossing Star Universal Anthem to herald the entrance and arrival of our Holy Father. Thank you, Father. Please may we be upstanding as we take the Brotherhood of the Crossing Star Anthem. 
Dr. Wori, get set for the BCS Creed, please. While we're still upstanding, I invite to please step forward Bishop Dr. E.G. Wori to take the BCS Creed. The BCS Creed. I believe in the promised comforter. I believe in the comforter. Leader Olumba Olumba Obu. Leader Olumba Olumba Obu. The father of all righteousness. I believe in his first begotten son, His Holiness Olumba Olumba Obu, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who gave himself for us all and redeemed us from all iniquities. Purifying unto himself a peculiar people. The kindness and love of God has appeared towards us. Not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercies. We are saved by the washing of regeneration. And renewing of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Having therefore a kingdom, kingdom. whose builder and maker is God. God. Let us have a thankful heart. heart. For he is faithful in his promise. He He is King immortal. He is King supreme. Unto whom be all honor, all power, all glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Three of the chairs of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, our dear Father. Thank you for gracing this ceremony with your holy presence. Thank you for your children from far and near are here for this public lecture in honor of the ancients 
of days. Father, before your arrival, we have had the opening uh, keynote address by the chair of this session, uh, His Grace Nathan Ike Uzoma. We also had in our midst the former governor of Cross River State, His Excellency Donald Duke was also here to give a good word message and he had a pressing assignment at the Obong's Palace and he has left for that assignment. Father, present before you are your children from all walks of life. Before you we have some of your distinguished children that are to deliver our lectures today. We have in our midst Professor Callistus Ndaha is here in our midst. You're welcome, sir. We also have in our midst His Excellency Abdul Salam Pasma is also here. Thank you very much. We also have in our midst Dr. Lawson Mbogos, all the way from London. We have the chief imam of the Calabar Mosque also present here with us. And your children, some of your children that will also deliver paper from BCS, on BCS perspective, uh, Christ Patrick Shepherd, Oga Osim, and His Grace Innocent Omini. Please, warm round of applause for them. We well, have your children from the academia and also others from all walks of life that are here for this ceremony. At this point, our Father, with your kind permission, we want to proceed with the rest part of this program. Let me invite to please step forward Dr. Francis Okezie, uh, the lead master of ceremony, to introduce the lead speaker for today's uh, presentation. Dr. Okezie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for honoring us with your presence. We are now going to the lecture proper. And we have in our midst a British of Kenyan descent, an international conference speaker with a wide range of managerial, organizational, and administrative skills. As superintendent of Central Bank of Kenya, Sessional Site Manager, London Bureau of Newham, and as railway engineer, trainer, and assessor with Rail Track, London Underground Limited, and Network Rail. He's the founder and director of Just Lossing UK Limited, a railway training company. Phonics Protection Services Limited, and of course, Absolute Healthcare Limited. Let us welcome the speaker of the day, Dr. Lawson Ngobos. Eminent Father, my fellow members of this congregation, 
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lawson Bugus, and my first statement is to let you know that uh, I and His Excellency, uh, the President of the former President of DRC, were invited together jointly to this conference to handle different topics. His was unity in diversity as key for peace and sustainable development, while mine was connectivity of railways for economic development in Africa. All arrangements were made for the former President Joseph Kabila to attend this conference, and I have been in contact, constant contact with his protocol for finding the trap, uh, making arrangements, the travel for his, this conference. However, the events of the last two weeks were devastating. The outbreak of the Omicron virus and subsequent shutting of borders for six African countries brought about challenges of travel and protocol. The addition of Nigeria on the travel ban by UK presented the last uns uh, unsurmountable obstacle, and as such, we cannot have him here in our conference today. Last night, I spoke to his team in DRC who wished us well and a successful discussion today. I want to introduce myself. My name is Lawson Bugus. I come from a small town in Kenya called Naivasha. And in my looking, at the pride, like everyone has the pride of their hometown, I looked at the space that Nigeria occupies, 975,769 square kilometers, and the number of birds that are in Nigeria 975 species. I come from Naivasha, a small town of 54 square miles, a population not of 200 million like Nigeria, but 200,000, but which has got a species of 306 birds. Just about a third of all the species of birds in the whole of Nigeria. So that is the pride I come with because we have always something to be proud about from wherever we come from. My topic is the connectivity and uh, really connectivity and economic development. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Now, I would first want to talk about home which is Nigeria. I would not be in the railway today had my colleague not introduced me into the whole idea of network rail. But before I go there, I will just give you something a little about myself. I was born in Naivasha in a family of seven. My father, an ex-serviceman in the Second World War, my mother, a peasant lady. I went to CCE primary, CCE primary school in Thompson's Force, government Somali boys boarding school for my primary, Naivasha girls secondary school. Don't be surprised, it is Naivasha girls secondary school for my secondary, Kagumo High School for my A-levels, the University of Nairobi, where I graduated and took my postgraduate uh, at East, Eastern and South African African Management Institute in Tanzania. I studied for my MSc from the University of East London. I did my law studies at the University of Wolverhampton, and I finally got my Doctor of Philosophy from the United Graduate College and Seminary International in the USA. Now, my, my career in the railways really starts from Nigeria. I was a sessional site manager with the London Borough of Newham in London. And a gentleman 
a friend came over to me and he asked me, Lawson, what do you normally do over the weekends? And I said in good English, I chill, mate. I really chill. And he said, would you like to probably find something else to add onto the weekend, maybe a bit of money? I tell you what, my middle name is actually money. And I said, I will come with you. And he introduced me to the railways. And from a very humble background, as a truck worker, I climbed my way up to an engineering supervisor, a full engineer, a lecturer in railway engineering. Now, it is one thing to want to go and become a truck worker when you are a manager in an organization. The biggest challenge was the family. My wife, actually, when I said I was joining the railway full time, she said, so you want to be bringing those orange clothes that smell of diesel and grease? And I said, yes. And she was very unhappy. But when she saw the paycheck, ladies and gentlemen, it made a big difference. Like we say, charity starts at home. So before I talk about the international, the African dream, let me read you a speech that I wrote with my friend Solomon Olubuyi from the United States on railway connectivity in Nigeria. And this is the speech. Your Excellency, the Honorable, my colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Compliments of the season to you all as we are all looking for a better Africa in the years to come. I consider it a special honor to be here and allowing me to present to this inaugural assembly an important discussion that is pertinent to us all about Africa, our motherland. I may not be from Nigeria or Ghana, but I'm proud to be African well-positioned continent in the world that has its averseness in land occupation larger in life to consume the whole of the America and the Europe put together. Besides, it's an abundant wealth of minerals and natural resources, its landscape and the general weather conditions surpasses all, but in spite of all these exceptional benefits of Africa, still finds itself in a hollow of despondency, so to say, behind in many socio-economic events of the civilized world. I have been called today to speak on the importance of railway sustainability for Africa development. I may not be saying anything new to many of us at this forum today, but will focus on the way forward to finding permanent solution to one of the major segments of the economic sector, transportation industry. We may not be able to exhaust all discussions today about the current problems and challenges facing the four major modes of transportation in the continent, which is attributed downturn of its economic status compared to the development of the developed nations of Europe, Asia, America, and so on in the 21st century. In particular reference with Nigeria, the question that bothers my mind is why are we where we are in the face of global economy around the world that we are living in today. Presently, the movement of people and all types of goods and all over the country is handled by road transport and to worsen it all, most of the roads are dilapidated, poorly maintained, hazardous and have constituted dead traps to the large majority of the populace. There is no doubt that Nigeria is one of Africa's countries that have spent a considerable amount of their financial resources building and expanding, modernizing her transportation, but mostly concentrate on roads above all other facets of infrastructure of the four modes of transportation. Scholars have held many debates and conferences of this nature addressing touchy economic issues affecting transportation with no constructive follow-up that may produce tangible outcome. Despite all efforts transcending the circumstances prevailing in the Nigerian economy translates the fact that where a nation is lacking in the factors conducive to growth, no amount of 
transport investment can produce economic development. Alliance for Africa Development, Progress and Integrity, which is an African diaspora organization, has been consistent in proposing ideas and facilitating different programs that may help the government of Nigeria in direction that may get things turned around for the nation, but perennial negativeness abounds with the attitudes of the recipients and the representatives of government at both regional and federal level has always mounted so dampened these genuine and logical proposals. One such proposal is the Lagos Ogun City Express Rail Services, proposed and being facilitated by AAAPI UK and USA, where similar impediments are constituting obstacles in the wheels of progress to getting the projects off the ground. Systems like the BRT, the Blue Line and the Red Line uh, that, were, uh, that were to be constructed constructed or are being constructed uh, in, in Lagos. I'm very proud to let you know that both the blue line and the red line were drawn in my office in Box Lane, Barking. Engineers came from here. We gave them the space. We contributed our, our minds and our brains to them. The ICR would require dedicated railway network to deliver the necessary levels of systems performance regarding journey time and reliability consistent with the strategic transport layout plans for Lagos and Ogun states. In Lagos, two days ago, I learned that there are people who wake up at four o'clock in the morning to travel 30 miles to Lagos and to get to work at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, leave work at five o'clock in the evening, and get to work at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the night. That is unsustainable. That's a 30 minutes journey. A 30 minutes journey that close, very well takes a good two to three hours. It's not for this time and age. I was looking at my paper this morning to realize that the distance from Abi Okuta to Lagos is 103 kilometers, 103.3 kilometers. The journey time is about three hours and 10 minutes. The same distance or longer, dis or in fact, a longer distance from London to Birmingham, 106 kilometers takes one hour, 20 minutes, just about half of that time and half of the time back. These are things we need to think about. The train, three train services that have been proposed uh, will run short commute simultaneously within the four segments of the track cycle, Badagre, Apapa, Leki, and Leki, Apapa, Badagre, Leki, Epe, Ikorodu, Ikorodu, Epe, Leki, Ikorodu Abiokuta, Abiokuta Ikorodu. Typical express journey times will approximately be not more than one and a half hours each journey section in combination with the two express trains running opposite direction. Typical express times would be just over two hours. So for example, Leki Abiokuta, Abiokuta Leki, or what they call the circle line per direction, on the main side circle line around Lagos and Ogun State, inter intermittently running around the cycle once every hour per direction. To ensure good connectivity, the intercity network stations would require enhancing public transport services, parking spaces, and inter-exchange inter arrangements. Now the cost for this project is, a whole, uh, is 3.5 billion US dollars. The design for the Lagos Ogun ICR is first and foremost to create permanent solution to the chaotic situation of legal transport problems in terms of journey times and reliability while also being environmentally and economically viable. Tunneling is adopted where no dedicated surface routes would be created without an acceptable dislocation of environment and costs. The forecast for the intercity railway demands 
between 50 to 150 million passengers per year are focused to the use of the Lagos Ogun Intercity Rail Connect for intercity and nominal trips where the preferred intercity network becomes fully operational, which, if allowed, could kick and be available and operational with only five years. Staging of the ICR network, the optimal staging of the Lagos Ogun Intercity Connect program would involve building uh, the, the first named line of Lake Epe Ikorodu, Ikorodu Epe Lake sector subsequent, st subsequent stages would be the Ikorodu Abeokuta, Abeokuta Ikorodu sector, and the third would be Badagre Apap, Apapa Lake and Lake Apapa Badagre sectors. International experience of large infrastructure development shows that the approximate, approximately in the approximately 10 years, that is what you would need to actually construct, finish, and be on the move. In the light of AAPI strategic approach with the technical partners, construction work can, can actually start as soon as these engagements is made possible. The financial arrangements are also in place to make that possible. It, it looks evident a good study of Lagos Ogun ICR would have positive economic benefits using universal cost benefit methodology guidelines which are conventionally applied to major transport and infrastructure projects. I needed to say this here today because charity begins at home. I cannot talk about interconnectivity of railways in Africa without looking at what is my home today. Now, I spoke with the governor and I accepted his unreserved apology for the red welcome, red carpet welcome I got when I came into the country uh, at, uh, at the Lagos in uh, Mutala Muhammad uh, Airport. I think, I see things sometimes very, very differently. I do not give the devil credit for anything. I would be there to say, look, I'm being held at this airport. I need me to sleep on the floor. I cannot move. I do not know whether I'll make this lecture today. Oh, the devil has done it, but we will smash on him and we'll step on him. It was not any devil's arrangement. It was God's arrangement. God meant it for that. I do not look at things in that way. That's number one. The next thing I want you to, to take from here is, and this may sound absolutely ridiculous, that there is no human being who should be labeled to have a disability. Listen to me clearly. No human being on earth should be called a disabled. They have a disability. And I'll tell you why. When I was in the university, a blind friend of mine called Joe, came and visited my room. He came to my room. I was in hall six, room 106, which means he had to step the, do the steps to come to the first floor. He came in, found my room. How, I do not know. I let him in. And when he came in and we shut the door, he said, Lawson, this room is very, very spacious. I said, how would you know? You're blind. He said, I can feel it. Now, how many of us can go into any room with our eyes closed and feel the space unless we are differently abled? The people we call disabled are actually differently abled. So if you take it from me today, I want you to know, to look at things in that kind of a positive way. Now, let me go to the topic of railways. The railways, of course, were introduced as part of the colonial development in our African countries. And the colon the, our colonizers build the railways. Africa has six different gauges of railway. Six different gauges. Which means if one rail was to connect and enter into another rail, you can never bring a train to run over that. 
So that's something for you to take home first. Second, when these rails were built, they were built at a tremendous cost. Tremendous. And indeed, when they were being built, even in the home country, like the United Kingdom, when they decided to build the railway between Mombasa and Uganda, and they took it to the House of Parliament, the Palace of Westminster, in the contribution of the debate, these were the words that were spoken by one member. What it will cost, no words can express. What its objects, no brain can suppose. Where it will start from, no one can guess. Where it is going, going to, nobody knows. What is the use of it, none can conjure. What it will carry, there is no one who can define. And in spite of George Curzon, who was by then British Foreign Secretary, superior lecture to this house, I clearly will brand it not, but a lunatic line. Now, this was the thoughts expressed in that assembly on the building of the railways. This railway went ahead to be constructed at a human cost of four persons a mile. Very tremendous human cost. At a lot and a lot of money. But what came out of this railway? It came out of this railway came in my country 133 towns and four cities today. And something we do not think about or look or even guess about that railway brought about the awareness that we can rule ourselves and this, hence the independence. So what was actually meant for a lot of bad translated to a lot of good. However, when we took over as independent nations in Africa, our leaderships in our countries, except two countries which I will mention, were oblivious of advantages of railways. And therefore, what did we do? We ran them down. We didn't maintain the railways. And therefore, they went all anything else but dead. The two countries that constructed railway lines in Africa after their independence, and in fact, it's only one country, is the Democratic Republic of Tanzania. Dr. Julius Nyerere was the only leader in Africa who built two new railway lines, two new railway lines after independence because he knew the advantage of movement within Tanzania and indeed within East Africa. East Africa came into a wonderful railway network that combined both Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. But down the road, as we come into the 70s, paperwork drawn by a man called Otto von Bismarck in 1884 in Berlin, in what some of you may remember in your history as the partition of Africa. What these guys did, they sat on a table, and they took the map of Africa, and they drew lines on it, and drew lines on it. One they called Gold Coast, another one they called Nigeria, another one they thought, oh, there's a mountain there, Kenya, and they looked around, oh yeah, there was something, yeah, Baganda, yeah, the Uganda, that, yeah, yeah, let's call that Uganda. And meanwhile, you had the Belgians having their Congo, you have the French doing their Cote d'Ivoire, guys who sat out there in Berlin that came to eat East Africa with everybody saying, this is my country. We don't want you. So what, did, what happened? The East African railways died. The East African airways died. The East African currents boat died. I sometimes find myself with a lot of difficulty to understand exactly why we 
would allow ourselves, and you have examples in West Africa as well, why we would allow ourselves to get that to happen. But of course, I am known to have very, very wild imagination, and I ask extremely stupid kind of questions. For instance, I ask myself, I wonder what would have happened if when Moses got to the Red Sea and touched the water, the water didn't part. And then sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if just the, that stone from David missed Goliath's head? So I'm not averse to having stupid kind of thoughts. So I might just, by talking about East Africa, coming up with some stupid questions like those, but they are important. So what we have found ourselves, found ourselves is a railway system that exists, that does not exist anymore, or exists in very, very, very poor conditions. Now, to make it worse in Africa is that we have our own cooperation. I was involved a lot of time in, the, the, in Ghana with Ghana Railway Development Authority, and we wrote lots of papers. We went to many, many meetings. What we did not know about talking on rehabilitation of the railway is that the people who were on ch in charge of these development authorities had already ceded off a lot of railway land to their friends. Maybe they sold it. So it was being difficult to implement what we thought should be done only because we are so stupid in the diaspora, we have no idea how land transacts in these countries. I had a very interesting time in my country as they were building the SGR of going to the Railway Training Institute. And because I lecture railway engineering, and you go, I started with charity begins at home. I said, let me use my knowledge to try and build our own people in the knowledge of railways. So that when the railways comes to be built here in this country, at least our people will get employment. So I went to the railway training school, talked to the principal, went to where the old school used to be, and thought, it's wonderful. We can do something here. But you see, trains actually run on rails. And the training of a train driver, you cannot do it, uh, you know, a theory. You cannot just sit in class and they draw things and, and understand how to drive trains. You have to out a train from a training school onto a main railway line and then join the main railway line and know how to shun the train, how to drive the train, how to be the pilot man for the train. So as I was going through this railway training school, I went to see my outage my way from the railway training school to the main line so that when we come and we are training our people, they will be able to get the practical experience. Lo and behold, between the railway training school and the main line were so many houses built that if I was to propose that we open it up, so many houses would be brought down and yet the people who are already running the railway are the ones who had sold the land so that the houses can be built. So you see, uh, I do kind of value my neck. I don't know about you. So I thought, I'm a man with a young family. If I push this too hard, my wife may be widowed and my children may not go to school. So I went back to the UK and, and, and lived unhappily thereafter. The next element is, because, of course, we couldn't train our, I, I, I wasn't able to, to, to help in the training, we would probably have had about 40,000 young men trained, and we, we, in Africa, you, we are very good, you know, we have so much unemployment. We always say about it, don't we? Oh, we have so much unemployment, we want our youth to get jobs, and we want to do this and this and this, and this is even happening in Nigeria, it happens in my country. We built a line with very few Kenyans doing it. Lots of Chinese came to do the railway line. Aren't you doing the same in Nigeria? Aren't you even still shouting, there's unemployment? Then we don't understand whether we do understand or we will never understand. But that is also another story, story for another day. Now, let's look about the interconnectivity in Africa. The Africa Integ Integrated High Speed Rail Network, um, an idea of the African Union jointly with NEPAD, is a fantastic idea. The idea is to build at least 12,000 kilometers of track 
in Africa, reconcile a lot of the tracks that are differently uh, gauged and get things moving in, in connectivity of Africa. The African Union High Representative for Infrastructure Development, who is the former Kenyan Prime Minister, Raila Odinga, uh, when appointed on this post, said the following, worries, his worries were corruption could be the project's biggest obstacle. Now, I've heard that word before. Maybe you have heard it, corruption. I think it doesn't sound quite good. And he said that would be the biggest article, uh, obstacle. Why did he say this was an obstacle? I will quote exactly what he said. I will give you an example of railway. You go to Ethiopia, and the rates are different. You go to Nigeria, they are different. You come to Kenya, you go to Tanzania, they are different. By the rates, he's talking how much it costs to build the railways there. Uh, that's a lot to do with uh, it says uh, rails are different, they are different. Yet, you find that same companies are doing the job. So the same company building the railway in Nigeria is the same company building it in Tanzania, is the same company building it in Kenya, but the costs are tremendously different. Now, uh, so, uh, enemy, so that's, uh, so, yeah, that has a lot to do with environment, investment environment to those countries, and this is an enemy of Africa which must be fought. How many of those battles are won will determine just how quickly Africa's first cross-continental high-speed rail rolls out to the, from the station, quoted Raila Odinga. Now, I would like to explain to you why I believe you have all these disparities. One, the cost of land in Africa is unbearable. It's impossible. You are trying to build a railway line. You have to go there and buy land from people who have it. And these people who have it will then be compensated. And they will be compensated in a very, very different way. 2018, I was in a railways meeting in Nepal discussing the railway line between uh, New Delhi and through Kuala Lumpur, through, uh, due, uh, the, from, from, um, from New Delhi, through the whole of uh, Nepal, Kathmandu, and going up to Tibet. And when I was in this meeting, one of the directors of railway building company had I am from Africa. And um, because, because the man said, there's a British guy here, so, the, this British guy was kind of, kind of black, you know, he, he must be from Africa somewhere, so, or Caribbean or somewhere. So, so, he invited me to his room in the evening to have a discussion. And he said, do you know why it is so expensive to build railways in Africa? We are just thinking about doing a 600-kilometer line here, which is going to cost us maybe 1.1 billion, but if you did it in Africa, it will be ending between 3.8 billion to 7.6 billion. And I'm telling you, those are the figures that are there. And he told me something which was shocking. He said, in one African country, when they, they knew where the new line will go through, and what do I mean by they knew? The people with the knowledge are not politicians. They are civil servants. They are the ones who know where the drawings through the drawings, which land this new line will go through. So what these civil servants did in those countries is, of course, to get their people or to get themselves to go quickly buy the land where the railway will come through. So they bought the land there. Now, lo and behold, three months later or four months later, the whole compensation scheme then began. The land that would have cost that, that had been bought, say, say the land was, say, 200,000, say, 600,000 naira, for instance, or 600,000 shillings. And the person who wants to buy the land would come to the farmer and say, I want to buy your land. And the farmer says, I don't want to sell my land. He said, no, no, you don't understand. Because the farmer doesn't understand, why would the person want to buy his land? 
But you see, the person buying his land knows that the rail will pass here and he will need compensation. But he doesn't want that poor farmer to benefit from the compensation at the right price. He wants to do it in a different way. So what they would then do is they would tell the farmer, how much does the land here cost anyway? And the farmer would say, half a million naira, or half a million shillings. Oh, 600,000 shillings or nairas. And then they would tell the farmer, I'll give you a million. Now, if you are even not me, if you are an angel from heaven, you might find it very difficult to, to turn down a challenge like that. So a million an acre, God damn it. I can only get half a million. Give it to me. So these sabo servants, these executives and their mates would then buy the land or then bought the land because here we are talking about a specific railway that was built in Africa. Then six months, four, uh, between four and six months down the road, compensation started. The railway which was to be built, they came to the owners of the land, and you've got the title deeds for the new owners, and these new owners quoted the same figures. Can you believe it? They were not making a profit. They quoted six, where you bought for 600,000 naira, they quoted $600,000. Figures are exactly the same. But tell me the difference. Tell me the difference. A hundred times. They sold the land a hundred times. Now you have officials in the, in the land department. The officials in the land department know exactly how much land has been bought. They can see this land was only bought the other day for 600,000 shillings. 600,000 nairas an acre. But suddenly this person who bought is now selling it to some organization for a hundred times. But the person in the department of land cannot question that because he is in it. He is a civil servant. He is somebody who is supposed to be protecting the system but is eating from the system. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to tell you this, that we have no problem with politicians at all. What we have problems are the professionals in Africa today. The professionals who will take a drawing and sell and accept that a compensation is done at a hundred times. The professionals who, being a doctor, will be instructed by a politician to go ahead and put poison into an, a, a needle and put the, piece, the, put the needle into Mr. So-and-so to kill them. But then the doctor will not say, no, I am trained to preserve life. He's a professional, isn't he? He will not. What he will do is to take the money and just get rid of that guy because he will say, if I don't do it, I probably will be the one who get killed. That is one big problem we have in Africa. And I learned this personally. In, in the 90s, I was in, in Kenya, and a good friend of mine invited me. He said, look, we have a contract here to build a presidential entrance to the Nairobi showground. And uh, because you have a construction company, why don't you just buy the tender document and uh, price it, and with a bit of luck, you get the job. So I did. Got the tender document, got my quantity surveyor to price it, took the tender document back, and we were all called to a tender opening board, so we, everybody who tended came and sat down. All the documents were open, all the prices were put down, and I tell you what, we were fourth lowest, fourth, not first, not second, not third, but fourth lowest. The chances of getting a, a job in that kind of a contract is zero. But when I got home, kind of disappointed, my brother told me, oh, don't worry, you'll do it, you'll do it. You know, he lives in my country. He said, don't worry, you'll do it. And I said, how would I be able to do it? He said, and I want you to listen to this word because it goes everywhere. I have connections. I have connections. Yes, he said, I have connections. You'll do the job. I said, okay, let's see your connections. So the following day, he got me early in the morning, took me to his connections. Then his connections, uh, within two hours, had already brought the document, written very clearly, awarded. Awarded, signed in green. And 20% cash deposit. 
So I, I, didn't, I, I don't like asking too many questions. Of course, when somebody brings you a contract like that, you think, oh, hallelujah, I've got the contract. No sooner did I get this document than I left my office for a cup of tea. Coming back in half an hour, I was told, uh, there were guys from the police who were looking for you. And I said, from the police? Yeah, they said, yeah, they are from the police. I said, I, I don't know about that. What were they asking about? They, they said, they actually came to tell you you are the one who got the tender. So I thought, oh, that's not so bad. If they came to tell me I, I got the tender, that's wonderful. Now you wait until I got home. I got home, and my wife said, what have you done today? I have guys from the military, guys from the police, guys from the CID at the gate saying they want to see you. I said, I got the tender. She said, you can't. You are for the lowest. I said, I did. She said, I've never trusted your brother. Never trusted your brother. But the thing is, I did get the tender. So I then went off to my watering hole close to my house. I was sitting in my car. And lo and behold, I had now visitors dropping in. You are the one who got the tender. You are the one who got the tender. How they know where I live, how they know where my watering hole, I have no idea. But yes, I got the tender. Now, when it came to actually examining the tender to do the work, I want to tell you, it was very, very shocking. Where we were supposed to have black cotton soil, we had, we had um, maram soil. Black cotton soil is a soil that you cannot put any building on. You have to dig it all out and take it out. A whole six to eight feet deep. Dig it all out. And you put in a lot of ballast to bring it to the level you can build a house. You are to price for that. But actually, it was maram soil. Where we had six millimeter steel, what was needed was two, two millimeter steel. So the guys called me, they said, Actually, you don't need 5.6 million shillings to do this job. With about under a million, you can do it. I said, no. I priced what I was told. I will put what I was told. And they said, but it's unnecessary. Why put six, six mil steel when you can actually manage two mil steel? I said, no. I will put everything that was there. The only thing I couldn't change is that I could, now, I could not now bring black cotton soil and take it out because the ground was quite good. So I said, how can you do a document like this knowing it's a total lie? I was talking the chief architect, the chief quantity surveyor, the main guys in the Ministry of Works. How could you do that? Now you know it. It's not the politicians to blame. It is our civil servants, our professionals, whom we call professionals, who have sold our heart to the devil. Now, let me now move forward. Uh, to, I have already told you what African Union is thinking of doing, and it's 12,000 12, uh, 12, 12, uh, uh, kilometers of railway for interconnectivity. How far they have gone with that, I have absolutely no idea, but I do wish them well, and I hope they have done very well in it. First of all, I, here I would like to, to commend with a lot of gratitude Africa Development Bank. It has financed a lot of feasibility studies for railways in Africa. However, and I'm sorry to go back again to the professionals, is that what they would do, they would get a feasibility, they would take the proposal to, to the, the, the parliament, and whilst they're waiting, two years would pass, and of course, figures have changed. They would then go again to Africa Development Bank, do another feasibility. You know, I was once in the Ministry of um, Metropolitan in Nairobi. And I was, we were discussing the interconnectivity of the railway system within the city of Nairobi. Lo and behold, in the minister's office were six feasibility studies, six, all piling up dust on top of shelves. Each of them, you know, cost $3 million. So you think, with $3 million times six, that's $18 million, you would have done so much with it. Even if you didn't put it in the railways, you probably put buy, build hospitals and things like that. But that's another story. Right. Now, I have my own personal proposal and my own vision for Africa in terms of railway connectivity. 
And for us to be able to understand that, I think it's an ideal time. Uh, the young man who was to play a video for me, uh, have we got the man to do my video? I would like you to watch this video with a lot of interest because my proposal will come directly from what you see in this video. So if you could play it for us, please. Now, if it's giving you difficulties, let me continue. If there, there are difficulties at all, let me continue. So you can, oh, is it all right, ladies and gentlemen? Let's, let's continue. Forget about it. Technology sometimes fails us. It's good I'm not a te technology person, so I can actually say shut it up and let's move forward. Now, this video is on road and highway connectivity in Africa. This was a proposal of United High, High Commission for Africa. And the, uh, the proposal is the following, that we have, nine, we have nine corridorways of roads that will connect African cities and African countries. Number one is the Cairo to Dakar, 8,636 uh, kilometers of it almost actually fully completed as a highway. You have Algiers to Lagos. Algiers to Lagos, that road has been completed with only 200 kilometers left to be done. You have Tripoli to Cape Town, 10,808 kilometers. Tripoli to Cape Town, you can see that distance. That one is short, fairly short, of getting anywhere near anywhere. You have only about 30% of that highway uh, completed. You have Cairo to Cape Town, 10,288 kilometers. That is 88% complete. Dhaka to Jamena, 4,500 kilometers, is 80% uh, complete. There's actually only 775 kilometers that require uh, putting tarmac, but there are shades of, uh, of dust roads there. You have Jamena to Djibouti, which is 4,219 kilometers, very, very poorly developed because, of course, as you know, it will be going through Chad, to be going through difficult countries and terrain. Uh, then you have Dakar to Lagos, uh, which is another 4,560 kilometers, which is 83% complete. You have Lagos to Mombasa, 10,269 kilometers, only about 58% complete. And then you have the Beira to Lobito, that is coming from Angola, Lobito, to Beira in uh, Mozambique, 3,523 kilometers, about 60% complete, but the rest of it is joined by dust roads. So we have already something to work with. 
we already have something to work with. In which case, and what is actually my proposal? While African Union is pushing for 12,000 kilometers of railway, I am actually proposing 56,683 kilometers of railway in Africa. You will ask me how, Dr. Lawson, can you think of that? And I'll bring you many years back. In 1971, in my secondary school, my principal, Mr. Rupani, actually told us there's a new movie called 2001 Space Odyssey. It's a movie that had been done to show what will be happening in space in 2001. That's 30 years. And we went and saw this movie, and lo and behold, today, exactly those things are there. You've got space stations out in space. You've got guys going out to space and coming back. Exactly what was in movie 1971. So, if that was done in 1971, 71 and it was completed in 2001 in my lifetime it is there i tell you what what i'm proposing is possible and it will be done how can i say it can be done Th remember what we said about compensation for land can you remember we talked about compensation for land where you know where six six hundred thousand naira will be actually compensated at uh, six hundred thousand dollars yeah we talked about that what my proposal is it's a new system of building the railway called the Skyways. The Skyways is a suspended railway system that actually drives up in kind of almost above the ground, about 15 to sometimes 18 feet above the ground. So the rails would actually be suspended up in the air in kind of something. I tried to actually get... Uh, this picture, which I'll try to show you, I tried to get it uh, done by the, comp by the technology over there, but I couldn't. Uh, but if I could try and show it to you, I don't know how good this will be and how far you can see it. Can everybody see that suspended railway system up in the sky? Yes, that is my proposal. Now, this proposal is that when it comes to doing any feasibility, the cost of feasibility is zero. Roads are already existing. Already all the, all the things have been taken care of. When it comes to compensation for the land, we shall use the road reserves or we shall use the space between the highways so it's already in the ground. Then, when it comes to actually bringing in this technology, it's Russian technology from a Russian gentleman called Vladimir in Belarus. They started this technology there. They tested it in Belarus, and they have now built a big factory in Sharjah, in the Emirates, ready to move to build these kind of things for us. The cost, the cost of building a kilometer of railway using this system is about a tenth of the cost that we are using to build the conventional railways today. So that's, that is something to think about. Now, talking about the advantages of it, I'll just pull out some papers here. The advantages of it. One, the speed. I was in Tanzania uh, for the Dar es Salaam to Morogoro and uh, to Matukupora uh, railway connections. It's electrics, electrical multiple engine. This is one of the fastest trains in Africa at 125 miles per hour. I was in Ethiopia for the new line that goes to, through Eritrea to Djibouti. Very fast, 130 kilometers per hour, which is very, very good. Now, the speed here, we are talking about a top speed of 500 kilometers per hour, which means if you are to travel on it, it will be three or four times the conventional speed of the fastest trains in Africa today. Oh, sorry. Oh, I dropped something. Thank you. So, we are looking at a system 
which will, co will carry cargo, and uh, this would, at any one time, would be carrying over 200 metric tons of cargo at speeds of up to 350 kilometers per hour. And when it comes to maintenance, the maintenance is fairly, fairly low. It comes to carbon emission, carbon emission is extremely low. Now, how do I propose to get this out of the way with the people and the teams that I've been talking to about? The one thing about the highways which have been built is that they are all under highway authorities. They are not under a government of one particular country. And I'm now looking, looking at the, the highway, the, 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 jeep, the first of the roads that I talked to you about, the Cairo to Dakar. All those highways are within different highways authorities, whether it's from the Maglev between Cairo and Tunisia, there are new road authority between Tunisia through Algeria to Morocco, and as you come down, there are roads authorities that are there. We need to work with these road authorities so that it will, will circumvent the issues of dealing directly with people who will be demanding money that we can bring railways to Africa and nothing can be done if they do not get the money, which kills me. Now, the other thing is the possibility of working this is also, and very important, the money. So the question is, where are we proposing to get the money to these very, very crazy ventures. Before I come to the money, let me explain to you one thing which you may not know. Railways are not cash cows. Railways do not make money. I'm from England. We private, Margaret Thatcher privatized our railway, believing that they will make a hell lot of money. Up to today, they still subsidize the railway. A friend of mine, uh, Dr. Malawi from, from um, Glasgow called me another day. He said, Lawson, uh, there's a proposal here on my hands from the government of Malawi. They want to get a BOT arrangement for building a railway there. BOT means build, operate, and transfer. And I told to Dr. Malawi, I'm a railway person. I've got bad news for you. Railways don't make money. Railways make connectivity, and connectivity brings about economic development. That's what happens. Now, in this case, if this proposal was to come, then we would have something that requires to make money. How would we propose to make money and support this railway system to move forward? So, how do we propose to do that? Now, the proposal is quite easy is that as our railway goes through the various stages, then we will build stopovers there, and those stopovers there will mean that there will be developments that can be sold either as housing or businesses or land. I also propose that out of all African countries, each of them have to, have to make available at least a five-kilometer square industrial park, which can be built with our funds, which will bring industry into Africa, and which is going to bring employment to Africa, and which is going to bring generation of revenue to the railway. Now, ask yourself about anything that is made anywhere. Making aircrafts, make, building trains. Why don't we do it in Africa? We've got loads of brilliant young people just give them a bit of knowledge. We can build come, uh, factories to build the trains that we shall put in this line, to build the railways that we put in these lines, to build everything. One thing I have got to tell you, and I believe this for sure, that when God made the earth, Africa was his footstool. So we can do it. It's possible. So finally, uh, to sum up, let me now go to the money. How shall we have the money to do this? And for so doing, I would like to actually uh, produce a document which I want to read to you exactly the way the document came to me.
This is the document that I want to share with you. This document I came to me through people I've worked with in various projects, an organization called European Economic Development Council. And this is what the letter says. Dear SARS, subject railway connectivity in Africa. We are greatly honored by your invitation to address the issue of railway connectivity in Africa. Your proposal to advise a 58,000 kilometer railway connectivity in Africa is over the next 10 years, though extremely ambitious, is achievable. EEDC, that is European Economic Development Council, in partnership with US Demint is ready, willing, and able to support the venture. Please assure all who see your vision, our support and our cooperation. You are the first people I've shared this vision. They are asking me to assure you that we have got the support and we have got the cooperation to make these funds available. The European Economic Development Council is an institution registered in the European Union as a public welfare organization and at the Spanish Home Office primarily aimed at providing funding solution to governments from emerging countries. Kindly accept the assurances of my highest reward. Now, what I always do is I want you to believe me by seeing that letter. That is the letter that has been written to you, to me, to say we can do it. I am extremely, extremely glad... I'm extremely glad at being given this opportunity to address this wonderful congregation and you wonderful people. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll end up by telling you this, that when I was spending the night on the floor at um, Muqtala Muhammad International Airport, I was thanking God. I was saying, it's so wonderful, Father. You've given me a red carpet to sleep on. I'm sure you sort these things out. Did he or did he not? He did. I'm here today. And no devil can be ashamed because he had nothing to do with it. Thank you very much. Very, very, very much. A product of months of hard work. Now we can invite the, where is she? Hello. The next speaker. Okay, go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, please be assured that we are working to ensure that uh, we do not waste any further time. Please join me as I welcome the next speaker, the Patriarch Christ Shepherd Oga Osi from Ikom Local Government Area and Cross River State of Nigeria. He is a member of the First Heavenly Order of the Christ Shepherd and Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. He was a member of the 144,000 Virgins Body for 20 years. He is a trained journalist and media professional in the Republic of South Africa. He is also a certified film producer and broadcaster, having been trained at New York Film Academy in USA. He has served as the general manager at Star Cross Television, BCS deputy spokesman, president of the 144,000 Virgins Body, chairman, BCS Priesthood Board of Governors, and BCS Ambassadors to Asia. Patriarch Oga Osi has traveled extensively to about 20 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, and America for the purpose of missionary work and special training. He is a prolific speaker and creative writer on dogmatic and social matters. He will be talking on the topic, the teaching and philosophy of leader Olumba Olumba Obu on global peace and unity. Please join me as I welcome on stage the Patriarch. Christ Shepherd, Olga Ose.
In the name of our Lord, His Holiness, Olumba, Olumba, Ubu. In the power of our Lord, His Holiness, Olumba, Olumba, Ubu. Now and forevermore. Amen. Beloved brethren, first of all, I'd like to recognize our beloved Holy Father, His Holiness, Olumba, Olumba, Ubu. Here represented by the Secretary General Affairs of Brotherhood of the Cross and Star and Senator of the Federal Republic, the Petra Christ Shepherd Senator B.W. Deggy. I also recognize the Chairman of the occasion, also the BCS spokesman, the Petra Ededa Chibong, and his deputy, Her Eminence. Glory Sandwell, the Dean of the College of Bishops, Petra Basi Mowo, and the Universal Women's Fellowship President, Her Eminence Victoria Imowo. Your Excellencies, Royal Fathers, Religious Leaders, Legal Luminaries, Academic Dons, Members of the Fourth Estate of the Rim, Distinguished children of God. The topic which I'm asked to present in this auspicious event is Leader Olumba Olumba Obu's teaching and philosophy on global unity and peace. I adore the Holy Father, Leader Olumba Olumba Obu, for according me the grace to speak at this all-important public lecture in his honor. I do this with great sense of humility because the being in whose honor and instance this lecture is held is an enigma of indescribable statue with unassailable qualities never before seen in any man since the beginning of time. Unto him be all honor glory, adoration, and power for manifesting in flesh to teach man and lead him to the accurate knowledge of truth and for making men mortals like us beneficiaries of his internal kingdom by which reason I have the grace from him to speak in a special event of this magnitude. You will agree with me that owing to the intractable challenges around the world, there couldn't have been a better time to discuss unity in diversity as key to sustainable development. As a human family, never has the world been this fragmented and confused, if I may say. So I find this year's theme to be absolutely apt, engrossing, and thought-provoking. The world today is increasingly assailed with some of the most obstinate conflicts arising from differences in tribe, culture, nationality, religion, politics, and ethnic identity because of the quest for control of power, natural resources, and citizenship. As a result, ethnical breakdown, civil strife, civil war, minority righteousness, religious bigotry, terrorism, economic meltdown, political instability, and violent clashes, all of which would normally be regarded as unusual in the world, are today common forces and occurrences affecting the human family. In the spheres of religion, the Shias are in deep disagreement with the Sunnis, Coptic Christians do not agree with Pentecostal, and neither do the Orthodox. The animosity among the Hindu Muslim population in India, the suppression of religious rights in China, all point to the elusiveness of unity and tolerance amongst the various religious faithful. As we speak today, racial intolerance in the United States of America is still very pervasive despite the resolve by the government to tackle it. Here in Africa, the Luhia and the Kikuyu tribe of Kenya do not agree. Despite being one 
despite being in one nation for more than a hundred years now, this amalgamation, the fault lines between the Yorubas, Hausa, Fulani, Igbos, and the tribes in Nigeria is still very evident. Across Africa, tribal wars and schism dot every part of the continent. On the political front, even as we speak, tensions are building on the Ukrainian border with Russia. The rhetoric of war and fear of attack are yet to subside in the Kore Korean Peninsula. The Israeli attempting the Israeli and Palestinian crisis is still raging. China is attempting to extend its hegemony over Taiwan. And the South China Sea, border tension continue to mount between India and Pakistan. Syria, Libya, and other Arab nations are yet to fully recover from the Arab Spring. Also, the war in South Sudan, the collapse of the state of Somalia, the ethnic conflict in Uganda, Burundi, Ethiopia, amongst others, show how elusive peace and unity have been to man. Almost every continent, the refugee crisis is on the increase. Even nature, even nature is not at peace with man. For as we speak, volcanic eruption have continued to kill many and distort activities in Indonesia and other earthquake-prone regions of the world. Cyclone, tornado, tsunami, and heavy rain have caused flood and destruction of life and properties in Southeast Asia and North America. With the recent tornadoes in five central states of USA, the country has not fared any better with the chaos of natural disaster, which have claimed several lives. Diseases and pandemic have practically shut down the world and continue to defy man's understanding. Here in Nigeria, we have grown all too familiar with horrible stories about kidnapping, killing, maiming of innocent citizens, terror attack, banditry, and all sorts of criminality. Effort at global peace and unity through human ideology, political philosophies have remained futile. From the Westphalian Conference of 1648 to the Vienna Conference of 1815 to the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919, the Potsdam Conference of 1945, and all the peace advocacies and treaties by the League of Nations and organizations across the world have all failed to secure peace and unity among the human family. Likewise, the conferences and advocacies on climate change have failed to reverse the tide of natural disaster occasioned by abuse of, natural, of nature across the world. The unceasing rise of empires, human territories, with their pursuit to lead man also have failed in all attempts because their empires and kingdoms are founded on immorality, greed, lack of human empathy, self-glory, and have completely lost touch with required standards. Rather than lead man to attain the basic spiritual height, the imperfect system of man's religion and culture is facing a daily decline. The result of which is confusion and conflict of unimaginable proportion between and amongst nations. Although the Almighty God richly endowed various nations with natural resources and the requisite human capital, one cannot agree more with Harry Truman when he says, selfishness and greed individual or national, cause most of our troubles, unquote. It is unequivoc unequivocally clear that our world must, like a hungry lion, feed on peace and unity if it must turn from the tide of self-destruction. People across the world must not only call for strategic repositioning and the rebirth of a peaceful world, but must be seen to be working for a truly robust and sustainable development by first seeking peace within oneself. No one can give 
what he does not have. All over the world, people are seeking for political renaissance, social integration, religious tolerance, economic emancipation, cultural rebirth, ethnical renaissance, patriotism, honest leadership, and total love and harmony within the human family. Some are calling for new leadership that will refocus on spiritual rebirth and amend areas in the constitution of various nations that tend to encourage disunity. They call on leaders to encourage interfaith and multidimensional religious dialogue, especially the Christians, Muslims, and family units. As a pedestal to concretize the drive for global and national unity. Respective governments, religious bodies, NGOs, agencies have also profiled various spiritual and scientific ideology that will pursue a new national global policy of a systematic and strategic indoctrination of on the fundamental imperative unity in diversity. Some also think that the unity of the human family should be taught in our schools, and leaders at various levels must create a political, social, economic, religious, and cultural ambience of justice and fairness, for there can be no peace and unity without justice in addition to shared value and a sense of equity amongst the constituting ethnic group. Distinguished guests, despite all the effort made to achieve unity in a diverse world, including the numerous peace advocacies, peace pact, and peace accord, the menace of terrorism, religious war, is still staring us in the face. And the fault lines, biblical account opens our understanding to a peaceful, united, and serene world governed by oneness and the rule of love. God called it the Garden of Eden. And though dominion was given to mankind over, was given to mankind over all other creation, the ultimate instruction was the brotherhood of the creation. However, the world as it is today is the complete opposite of the Garden of Eden era. Our people and government have continued to wonder about global peace question, aimlessly seeking unity, but leaving behind for each generation a more fractured and chaotic human space. This is because there have not been enough policies. This is, this is not because there have not been enough policies or money invested in peace effort, but because everyone involved in the quest for a solution is part of the problem. The question, therefore, is how can we provide a solution to a problem we are all part of? As we already noted, the cracks within the world are created by man. The supernatural teacher, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, in his infallible divine wisdom, gave some clues to the origin of the global crisis. According to him, some of the following are responsible for the lack of peace in the world. One, absence of love. In furtherance of the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the Holy Father, great leader Olumba Olumba Obu, are centered on love. The absence of love remain the greatest catalyst to the incurable violence in the world. In volume one of the everlasting gospel, he says, you ask, what is the cause of the problem in your family? It is because you do not have love. When you ask, what is the cause of trouble in Nigeria? The cause of the problem is because Nigerians have no love. The cause of the trouble in Africa is because of the lack of love. The trouble in the Western world is also due to the fact that no white man has any atom of love in him. Equally, the troubles and tribulation in the world are also as a result of the lack of love 
for one another. You find this in Everlasting Gospel, Volume 1, Chapter 14, verses 126 to 127. Two, another cause of the problem as described by the Father is leadership failure. It is less likely to be doubted that leadership failure is one of the greatest challenges of today's world. From the home to school, community, public and private sectors, there are leadership gaps that must be breached. The greatest teacher, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, has this to say about leadership and its role in peace building. And I quote, There are problems in the world today because of the absence of good stewardship. The preachers behave differently from what they preach. They tell you to do what they say and not what they do. Today, people are clamoring to amass wealth, to occupy important political and economic positions, but no one is interested in serving God. The proliferation of churches is an indication of man's rebellious tendencies and quest for materialism. Charity, it is said, begins at home. No person who himself unorganized can organize others. In the whole world, who has endeavored to resemble our Lord Jesus Christ? If you must lead, you must first surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit, for a blind cannot lead a blind. You find this in the everlasting gospel, volume 1, chapter 22, verses 49 to 53. Another example given by the Father is communication gap and intolerance. Recently, at the COP26 conference in Scotland, where leaders convened a few months ago to discuss climate change. Accusation and counter accusations trail the floor. Leaders could be seen politely and diplomatically directing indictment at each other, whereas the focus was to seek unanimous action on the reduction of carbon dioxide. So we find that violent communication are capable of fueling violent action. To curb this ugly situation, the supernatural teacher, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, admonishes us when he says, good words prevent quarrel, whereas evil and provocative words fuel animosity. If you observe closely, the source of all problems in the world is traceable to evil words. The bad seed sown by the enemies by the enemy are the evil words, abuses, and causes, which ultimately are responsible for the sickness, starvation, poverty, war, mishap, and death. It is responsible for all the problems in the world. Thus, it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, 20, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You find this in Everlasting Gospel of the Holy Father, Volume 1, Chapter 65, Verses 14 to 15. The ultimate source of peace. It is written that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confirm the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confirm the things which are mighty. And best things of the world and things which are despised had God chosen. And things that are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, no leader or government in the world can unite the world or give peace to man. Prophet Isaiah, in his revelation, confirmed this when he said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. You find this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. They are both confirms that the only government, that only the government of the Almighty God, who is the Prince of Peace and the Everlasting Father, can unite the world and give peace to man. It further alludes to the teachings and philosophy of leader Olumba Olumba Obu, that unity in diversity is the brotherhood of all creation, including man, animal, fishes, angel, spirit, moon, stars, nature, animate and inanimate creatures, as was at the beginning of time. Unity in diversity is a reunion of all creation with nature, which is love and the brotherhood of all creation. It therefore goes beyond the unity of people in a particular state, region, community, or tribe. Such unity can only promote the ideology of carnal man and there can be no true peace and sustainable development. It is important to know that every created spirit lives in two dimension realms, the spiritual realm and the physical realm. Both realms of the human existence are controlled by the Holy Father himself. Before anything can happen physically, it must first have the spiritual approval of the Holy Father. For the world to be united and return to peace, it must first be approved in the spiritual realm before it can be achieved physically. It is the Holy Spirit who is the Almighty Father alone that controls the spiritual and is sometimes allow man to play certain role to complement his design for the physical world. Therefore, unity in diversity, being a spiritual process, can only be achieved at the instance of the Father God himself. For he alone knows the source and origin of every created and the purpose for which it was created. Thus, it is written, in the beginning was the world. The world was with God and the world was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 11 to 17, John the divine confirmed that he that is called the word of God is also called the king of kings and lord of lords, and his armies are clothed in white, linen, fine and clean. John the Divine also revealed that at his appearance, he will invite people from all walks of life to fit at the feast of the great God, which depicts unity in diversity under the rulership of God. Distinguished guests, today offers me another opportunity to state without fear of contradiction that the scriptures have fulfilled in brotherhood of the cross and star. Where the, the scriptures are fulfilled in brotherhood of the cross and star, where the almighty father, the prince of peace, the king of kings and lord of lords, the very word of God that made all things, the supreme Godhead has taken the veil of flesh to unite the world and give true peace to man. He is no other than leader Olumba Olumba Obu. He is a supernatural and a universal creative force who is the fullness of the Godhead, who remains the indefatigable controller of the limitless universes and all planets put together. The infinite nature of his existence make him ultimate to all forms of religion and ideologies. To state the obvious, everything from creation was dwelt in leader Olumba Olumba Obu. And he regenerated them into the manifestation during the creative process. Throughout human history, apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Leader Olumba Olumba Obu is the only being that can say, my peace I give unto you. Go, I am before and behind you. He alone can say, go, you have been discharged and acquitted. He alone can say, I have forgiven your sins. For he is that same spirit that came as Christ. And he has come again in his most exalted authority as the King of kings and Lord of lords with a new name, Olumba, Olumba, Obu. He is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Although, although some people may try to speak like leader Olumba, Olumba, Obu, the fact is that unless he gives you the authority to speak, it will have no effect. Because I repeat, you cannot give what you don't have. Leader Lumba Lumba Abu is the only spiritual leader in human history that has been able to put power in his name. And when people call on the name Olumba Olumba Obu, they receive instant solution to their problem. He is the only being in human history that can manifest himself spiritually and physically in all planes and realms at the same time. The same time. Now, in one of his sermons, he said, as you see me standing before you here, I'm quoting him, he said, as you see me standing before you here, I am also seen in all planes. As you are listening to my sermon right now, all spirit, angels, men, the dead and the living, as well as all creation in various planets are also receiving these teachings. He continued. He said, know from today that I have not come to teach the blacks and whites alone. I have come to teach all creations of God, including human beings, animals, birds, fishes, and other creations. Whether you are a president, a governor, commissioner, billionaire, a professor, or anything, you must submit yourself to the Holy Spirit who is now teaching the world. He said, the greatest work which the Holy Spirit has come to do is the unification of all inhabitants of the world into one foe. This is the work which I have come to do. God has never revealed himself to the whole world in one day. And at the same time, he reveals himself to people one after the other, just as he is revealing himself to some of you today. Therefore, from today, do not preach division, segregation. Neither should you say that some people are not brotherhood or that some are not children of God. But rather, go and preach to them that all creations of God are brethren, whether they are Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Baha'i, Ekist, or Pagans. This is the teachings of leader Olumba Olumba Obu. Beloved brethren, he alone can unite and lead the entire creation in peace because leader Olumba Olumba Obu is peace personified. He is at peace with every created spirit, seen and unseen. He has never quarreled with any creature including animate and inanimate. He has never killed or consumed any flesh from beginning of time. He is a strict vegetarian. In fact, the father teach, teaches that even when mosquito bite you, don't kill that mosquito. That is his teachings. So, because he is at peace with every creature, he alone can give peace to man. And this is why animals, birds, and all creation are in peace with him and takes directive from him. Now it is on record 
that at a tender age in Biakman, Lidaobu was playing with his playmate when a bird flew across his head and defecated on him. His playmate laughed and mocked at him. Young Olumba was not angry, but he said to his friends that the bed will come back and apologize. Almost immediately, the bed returned and perched on his shoulder and showed remorse. Lidobu accepted the act of apology and let the bed to fly away. His playmate cautioned him, cautioned young Olumba, that he could have killed the bed for meat, but Lidobu said to them, if someone offends you and later apologizes, you ought to forgive him. When her eminence was reading from that uh, compilation, she has also told us the situation where Lidobu resurrected a dead monkey. A dead monkey. Meaning, he is at peace with all creation. He does not take pleasure in one destroying anything. And it is because of this all this, all this scenario shows the authority, love, and peaceful disposition of leader Olumba Olumba Obu over all creations. <laughs> Distinguished guests, to say that leader Olumba Olumba Obu is powerful is an understatement because he is the powerhouse of the universe. He alone can give power to any force in the universe. He alone. While other forces, all other forces, including Satan, have limited power without righteousness and peace, Lidolumba Lumbaubu is power, righteousness, and peace personified. This is what makes him different from any leader or force in the entire universe. Anybody can have limited power and do magic. You can go to churches like we have all over Nigeria. You see people doing magic and all that. Those are limited power without righteousness. But Lidobu has power and righteousness and peace. That is why when you come to him, he will tell you, my peace I give unto you. Another instance is that leader Obu does not negotiate for peace and unity like other worldly leaders and their agencies do. He can create peace at any time he wishes with his spoken words. He has the power to dethrone any leader or government whose agenda or activity does not encourage peace and unity. He has that power. If he's keeping quiet, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know what to do. But he has the power. Lidobu says he doesn't care about what people may say or think of him. But what matters to him is that he has come to save his own and to make the whole world one is a task that he must accomplish. He doesn't need military might, media campaign, or recognition of men to accomplish his mission. He uses only the words of his mouth to accomplish everything in the world. When he speaks, he must surely come to pass, no matter how long it takes. For instance, the Nigerian civil war in the 70s came to an end by the pronouncement of leader Olumba Olumba Obu. That he said, Nigeria must be won because God is physically living in Nigeria. In the early 80s, Nigeria and Cameroon were having dispute over possession of Bakasi. The tension was high, but Lidolumba Lumbabu declared that Nigeria and Cameroon are one nation and one people before the Almighty Creator. And there was no need for war amongst them. He further declared, there shall be no war between Nigeria and Cameroon. Beloved brethren, despite all the political differences between Nigeria and Cameroon, 
These two nations have continued to coexist as pronounced by leader Olumba Olumba Obu. When, when the white minority assumed supremacy over the black majority in South Africa, leader Olumba Olumba Obu wanted both the whites and the blacks to coexist as one people and one nation. Thus, in 1988, he declared that the apartheid regime will end in South Africa and Nelson Mandela will be freed from prison and will become the president of South Africa so that there could be equality of all races in that country. This divine declaration came to pass in 1991 when the whole world watched Nelson Mandela walk through the gate of the prison as a freed man and in 1994... Nancy Mandela was elected the first black president of the Republic of South Africa. Also, as a way of demonstrating to America and the world that advancement in technology, infrastructure, and democracy does not make them superior to any other race, especially the blacks. Lido Lumba Lumbabu in the 90s pronounced that a black man will assume the highest office in America. He was very specific in 2005 when he said Barack Obama will be president in America. Then that was the stage of primaries between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. He was challenged. We brought out members, some of you know that when he made this declaration, somebody came from United Kingdom and told him, told the father, that if this year word come to pass, I will give you $100 million because the white will never allow a black man to enter White House. It is called White House because it is meant for the white, never for the blacks. But I said it will happen. And we all saw it that it came to pass when Barack Obama in 2008 a proud black man of Kenyan descent in East Africa was elected president of the United States of America. I am happy. I am happy that we have a guest here from Kenya. Let him today know that the pride of Kenyans. In October, I addressed a national press conference in Kenya, in Nairobi, and I told them that your pride as you go about bragging that you have produced a black, you have produced a president in America, that I came to tell you people that there is a black man called Olumba Olumba Obu, who is the moving force behind the success of Barack Obama as president of America. So thank you very much in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me also inform you that Lido Lumba Lumba Bu has publicly said that a black man will someday become the British Prime Minister. And a person of African descent will one day become the king or queen of England. He has said so. Recently, he has repeated it. And I tell you, God will keep all of us alive to witness the fulfillment of this statement. In the wake, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, Lido Lumba Lumba Bu revealed that the pandemic was meant to expose, to expose the lack of love and emphasize the need of human cooperation and oneness, irrespective of color, tribe, nation, or creed. It has also exposed the futility of man's knowledge in science, technology, weapon of mass destruction, military might, and others, and that man should no longer take pride in all these things, but should rather embrace the power and wisdom of God in all things. The most important lesson that man must learn from the pandemic is that no nation can survive in isolation, and that humanity needs to come together and take care of each other, promote the brotherhood of man, and acknowledge the universal fatherhood of God. And beloved brethren, to also let you know, when the pandemic started, 
Leader Lumba Lumba Bu informed all members of brotherhood that we should all comply with all the safety regulation as put by various governments. But one thing he, has, he, will, he will assure us is that no child of brotherhood will be affected by the pandemic. He told us. And I stand here today to say that with the millions of brotherhood members across the world, there is no business member that has been affected by COVID-19. While on a world tour to the Republic of South Africa in October 2012, leader Olumba Olumba Obu revealed that the greatest scientist in the universe is love and brotherhood. With this virtue, everything is possible spiritually and physically, and the world will be a peaceful heaven for all. Unknown to many, spiritual warfare has been launched against principalities and powers of darkness, the controllers of human territories, agents of hatred and division. Testimony abound everywhere how Lidolumba Lumbabu has appeared to many men and women of mystical order in their shrines in, and temples in India, America, Australia, Asia, and various temples in Africa during their evil incantation and destroy such wicked activities against humanity. Just like, just as our Lord Jesus Christ arrested and subdued the wicked soul on his way to Damascus to kill the apostle of Christ, leader Olumba Olumba Obu is subduing all principalities and agents of the devil who would know that this world should be at peace. For it was prophesied by Daniel that in the days of this king, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left out to any other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. <clears throat> the divine impact of Lidolumba Lumba Bu is steadily transforming the world and breaking down the barriers of racism, nationality, tribe, sealing the cleavages of religion, and attracting all races of the world into brotherhood of the cross and star, where the divine philosophy of the unity of God's creation and the universal fatherhood of God is upheld in spirit and in truth, as nominated in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, saying, I saw in the night vision." And behold, one is like the Son of Man came with a cloud of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near him, they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall never be destroyed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the establishment of God's divine kingdom and government on earth by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Solines Olumba Olumba Obu, humanity is now in the state of spiritual migration from the old world into a new world. Although the state of affairs in the world presently suggests that Mankind is on the brink of total destruction. The fact is that with leader Olumba Olumba Obu, there is hope for the human family. What we are witnessing is the passing away of the old world and its system for the emergence of a new world order, which has been divinely designed by the supreme architect, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, through the instrument of brotherhood of the cross and star. Leader Olumba has revealed that in the new war, there shall be no military, no immigration, no police, no court, 
no political party, and there shall be no election. Leaders shall be appointed by divine ordinances and not by political election. Earlier on, the chairman of this event said that, he made a statement that something is going to happen to man. Something will descend vehemently on man. And these are some of the things. All these things you see in the world today will pass away. The only government that shall superintend over the affairs of all nations shall be the unified, universal, theocratic government of God, which is the government of God by God for the children of God. Democracy is one of those things who hit on man because democracy, which is reputed to be the government of the people by the people for the people, which although is considered as the best system of government by man shall cease because it has only increased division, anarchy, hatred, killing, among other destructive elements that have left the world in an unfortunate and pitiable state. All nations, continents, and tribes of the world shall return to their original name, and that name is brotherhood. All the continent, Africa, Asia, America that you see, Nigeria, Ghana, all will return to one name. And the original name is brotherhood. The Holy Father has said that every man you see today came from the same source. If you can trace his genealogy from his father to his grandfather and to his great-grandfather, we will all arrive at the same father. Despite numbers of people in the world, the Holy Father sees only one person. Whatever affects one person affects the other because it is the same spirit that dwells. The white, the blacks, the colored, and Indians are all one. Therefore, none should claim citizenship of any country. In God, in the Father, there is nothing like Niger citizen of Nigeria, citizen of Ghana, Cameroon, America, and all that. So, our guests from Kenya, do not be di uh, uh, disappointed with all the treatment you got at the airport. This is what the father is doing. Because Nigeria see you as a Kenyan. That is why those things happen. But very soon, you will not even need to carry passport and travel. You will walk freely because the father must have abrogated all the conditions enacted by man. And everybody will be seen as one. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is for this reason that the Holy Father has called on the Federal Republic of Nigeria to return to the first national anthem, which says, Though tribe and tongue may differ, in brotherhood we stand. According to the Holy Father, this anthem was inspired by the Holy Spirit, not for ceremonial purpose only, but also to remind Nigerians of the need to dwell in brotherhood, to keep the spirit and soul of the country together and unity despite the many differences. It is in this state of brotherhood that humankind shall experience peace and sustainable development. It should be made known that peace and sustainable advancement is the spirit, in the spiritual context goes beyond infrastructural and technological development as seen in most developed nations. It is a spiritual development of man with the word of God. That is what we mean by sustainable development. And the father have also said that when all these things shall come to pass, the aircraft, the train, like our brother presented, things that will be manufactured will not crash. The plane that will be manufactured with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, there shall be no plane crash. The train that shall be manufactured shall never involve in accident because all these things will be done with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So, beloved brethren, 
as I take, I'm going to summarize this accordingly and in line with his mission. He has established a divine universal institution of practical Christianity and calls it Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. Brotherhood of the Cross and Star is not a religion or a church, but a new heaven and a new earth. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not establish a church or religion. He came to institute the divine order of Christ's suit so that the will of the Father will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Religion has limit, but Christ's suit has no limit. The only doctrine known to Christ is love, which is the foundation of peace. Hence, in brotherhood, we practice Christ's suit and not religion. Leader Olumba Olumba Obu has introduced a unique guide for all seekers of truth. This divine guide is called the everlasting gospel of leader Olumba Olumba Obu. And while the Quran is authored by Prophet Muhammad to guide the Muslim family, the Bible, the Holy Bible of the Christian religion purported to tell the history of the earth from its earliest creation to the spread of Christianity in the first century AD. The Book of Mormon contains writing of ancient prophets who lived on the American continent from 600 BC to AD 421 for the later day Saint movement. The everlasting gospel is authored by the supernatural teacher, the fountain of wisdom, and the Holy Spirit of truth, leader Olumba Olumba Obu, to unite and guide all creations of God as revealed to John the Divine, saying, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You find this in Revelation 14, 6 to 7. The everlasting gospel of little Lumba Lumba Bu demystifies all scriptural books ever known to man. And there are no issues of life that are not addressed therein. It is the divine constitution of the new world order, which contains the laws and commandments of God to man from creation up to this day. Distinguished guests, as I take my seat, I wish to end this presentation with the following recommendation based on the teachings of leader Olumba Olumba Obu. One, all humankind must endeavor to practice vegetarianism and stop the killing of animals and fish. This way, man can live peacefully and in harmony with all God's creation. And you also have peace within yourself. Two, all system of government, including the UN, EU, AU, NGOs, religious bodies, political parties, etc., should adopt this divine slogan whenever they meet. And this slogan is, though tribe and tongue may differ, in brotherhood we stand. The third recommendation is that all leaders, irrespective of political, cultural, or religious belief and affiliation, should endeavor to own a copy of the everlasting gospel of leader Olumba Olumba Obu and must read the same at least one chapter in a week. Please, the gospel should be displayed for some of you that have not seen it to see it. In, in, in October, I presented this gospel in Nairobi to Professor Patrick Lomumba. When I gave him a look at it, 
and I explained the content, and he told me this will be his new weekend assignment because he must cover every page of this everlasting gospel before he leaves this world. That was what Patrick Lumumba said to me in Nairobi because he began to get the understanding of what is there. The last recommendation is that all created spirit, human beings, all created spirit in the veil of flesh, irrespective of your faith, you should endeavor to have a physical contact with leader Olumba, Olumba, Obu, while you are on this earth plane. Whether you are a baptized member or not, make it a priority to have a physical meeting with His Holiness Olumba, Olumba, Obu. While you are on this earth plane, that will be the climax of your sacrifice and the greatest achievement you will ever made on earth. And it is said, blessed is the man who have seen the holy face of God, His Holiness Olumba, Olumba, Obu. A word is enough for the wise. Thank you. In the name of our Lord, His Holiness Olumba, Olumba, Obu. In the power of our Lord, His Holiness Olumba, Olumba, Obu. Now and forevermore. No more division among the creatures of God. We are one. We are one. One, 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 one. We are one. We are one, 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 one. We are one. We are one, 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 one. Yes. Let's stop tribal war. At this point. Let's stop religious war. We want to invite to the stage the chairman of the day's event, the harbinger of the last covenant, once again, to present the copies of the everlasting gospel to our guests. You are welcome. The harbinger of the last covenant, Professor Ike Nathan Uzama. Amen. 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 You know, we're in a public lecture, so every segment has to be uh, taken care of. Uh, we don't have much time. You know, the Father is already seated here. His Holiness Olumba Olumba, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, seated and ably represented by the distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Patriot Christ Shepherd Deji, who also is the General Secretary, um, Secret, uh, General, Secretary General Affairs of the Brotherhood of the Coast and Star. There are a lot of engagements, which himself is personally involved, and the time, the schedule has run out of, out of time. We are supposed to start at a particular time, this is supposed to be our ending time. So he cannot be kept waiting because of his heading, um, even uh, everything in the BCS, relatively speaking. And things like Pentecostal and other activities going on. So keeping him here, we are not doing justice to the entire thing. So everybody coming up here to speak, Professor Kalistus Ndaha, His Excellency Abdurrahman, Ekpezu, representative, I mean the legate of the Sultan of Sokoto, as well as director of United Nations Polak, and His Grace Archbishop Innocent Mini. Please, we want to appeal to anyone coming up here to speak, to be very brief, summarize your lecture. Not because we don't have the time, not, not because we don't have, want to listen to everything as we have had the past this thing, but because of the time. Because of the time. How many of you agree with me? Wait a minute. If you agree with me, shout yes! yes. Amen. Yes. Now, we have uh, the everlasting gospel of the Brotherhood of the Cross and Star. 
Papa, I want to present this to our people uh, that have spoken. Please, can you call them one by one? Dr. Mbugus. This is the everlasting gospel of leader Olumba Olumba Obo, in whose name we are holding this annual uh, public lecture. It is volume one, two, three, but we are giving you volume one. Presentation of the Presentation. everlasting so gospel hoping of that, uh, leader Olumba Olumba Obo to volume. Dr. Lawson Mbugus, all the way from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Father. And uh, Professor Kalisus Ndaha, an erudite Christian scholar and president of Global Harvest Christian University. Um, you know, let me tell you this, Prof, don't be offended. If we are to look at it from the logical point, these are the kind of beings we may call Dr. Thomas. <laughs> Prof. Thank you. And um, delegate of the Sultan of Sokoto, His Excellency Ambassador Abdurrahman Ekbuzu Paxman. He is also the Director of United Nations Polax. And uh, this is for our friend, Dr. Joseph Kabila. You will, uh, as far as he's not present, you hand this over to him. That is our gift for him. Receiving on behalf of His Excellency, and we Dr. also Joseph have Kabila a copy here, former for President of DRC Congo, the representative of the Honorable Minister of Niger Data Affairs. Uh, I want to invite Dr. Honorable Dr. Mrs. Um, Ese Ruth Ahalolo. And uh, give me a copy there. And um, I came here with a lot of entourage. I want to give this on behalf of the born again Christians. Papa, born again Christians came from different churches. Uh, but we have one of them. She's a widow and the founder of a church. So please kindly come and take this. I'm sure you never knew. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sure you didn't know, but you will know. Eh? Let our belief not become an impediment. You know many of you that follow me here from different churches. Eh? Because you, we have heard, you know the bad stories that people, the campaigners of Calumny talk about leader Lumba Lumba, we have heard all those things. And you, even you yourself may not even know that this is the situation, so at least use your tongue to count your teeth. The books we have here in our souvenir, we have, um, <laughs> we have um, that uh, the I am that I am, which is abridged. We have the message of peace. All these documents, settle down and read it. And remember what the last speaker, the patriot, Krashefat Oga said, one of your duty in this world, for your own interest, make sure you set eyes on that holy one from heaven. Do you hear me? Thank you. Uh, um, and for now, I want to say that those of you that came with me, I'm talking to those that came with us from Worry, in our Habinja Mercy Storehouse in Worry, we are going to place Gospels, um, I mean the everlasting Gospels in the library there, so that you can go there and read them free and other materials following this lecture. God bless you all. Thank you.
the essence of dialogue. Without, we already saw Professor Kalisto Sundaha to come and tell us about the essence of dialogue in the quest for peace. He's been introduced severally. So we now invite him to come and give us his lecture. Welcome, <laughs> Professor Kalistus Ndaha. Thank you very much. Lecture presented by Callistus Chuksinda on the occasion of the annual public lecture 2021 edition on His Holiness Leader Ulumba Ulumba Obu. Team Unity and diversity as key for peace and sustainable development. Holding at Magoka Hall of Monte Suits Hotel, Calabar, Cross River State, today, the 18th day of December 2021. Your Holiness. Chairman of the occasion and uh, your excellencies and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to very quickly crave your indulgence to ride on protocols already established by former speakers because time is no longer favorable to us and granted that some of us traveled a great distances to be here and most likely may be traveling back to base at the end of this exercise. On record with Oliver Twist, I ask once again for your permission to present this lecture without the usual explanatory clauses that accompanies lecture in a public forum like this. Chiefly because most likely there are some other resource persons lined up to speak after me, whose time allocation I should avoid to uh, step into. Because in a forum like this, time factor must be considered. And uh, we shouldn't infringe on the time of other speakers. And that is the reason I'm asking you to permit me to present this lecture just the way it is, possibly in some aspect to bridge it. The, I am here on the honor and invitation of the chairman of this occasion, who happened to be the chancellor of our school, the having of the last covenant, his grace, most reverend Professor Ike Nathan Uzoma, and he asked me to present a paper for 45 minutes but given what is on ground, I doubt that I'm going to spend up to 20 minutes. I thought, <laughs> and Your Holiness, I've been specifically requested by the Chairman of Education to speak on a topic that is entitled The Essence of Dialogue for Peaceful Coexistence. And by way of introduction, coexistence is said to occur when two or more groups or types of people, ethnic, religious, creed, professional, and the likes, who differ from each other in entities like language, belief, culture, trade, or philosophy, decides to overlook these differences and therefore come together to live interact, share views, etc. as one. Therefore, 
peaceful coexistence now comes into play when all these attributes and characteristics are being observed in peace rather than in constant conflict and hostility competed in harmony without war, acrimony, and suspicion. It can also be enforced viable political systems, ideologies, economics, and cultures, including but not limited to intermarriages. Dialogue as peaceful coexistence and peaceful coexistence. At the heart of every faith, country, culture, and the likes lie a need to advance coexistence to enhance productivity, meaningful lives, sustainable society, and orderliness, qualities of lives, maintenance, and the extra greed on the fabric of our communities, peace depends not just on peaceful coexistence, but other efforts made to lubricate it. The parties and entities having full stake on the polity of this macro or even micro environment always need to see eyeball to eyeball to maintain what is on ground or fix any perceived dilapidation. Such acts involved in attaining these is called dialogue. By this nomenclature, the quorum needed for a successful dialogue is two. Extra persons are there to offer strength or purpose workable and acceptable ideas, and increased knowledge and notes on what should be done, how it may be done, who does what, and what practicable it may be done. As our weaponry and agitations become more powerful, our very survival as people on this planet depends on it. Nowadays, we talk chiefly of fundamental human rights, and applicable clauses, both the law, the process, implication and applications, which has the populace as a receiving end, must face some level or shift, either by or against levels of obedience or disobedience. Also, the applicable enforcement, reactions, supervision, and the agency for enforcement definitely will produce differing schools of thought. Some will gather to vote for high level uprising and mobilization in cases like this. Reactionary solution is the only way forward. Such process arrived to react in order to forestall peace and reduce, perhaps possibly prevent, Losses is what we call dialogue. Peaceful coexistence was a theory developed and applied by the Soviet Union, then Soviet Union, at various points during the Cold War in the context of Marxist Leninist foreign policy and was adopted by the Soviet allied for social forces states. It signifies, in essence, the repudiation of war as a means of solving controversial issues, and in addition, it applies, it implies a country or state or religion, race, etc., does not threaten the use or use force and the likes against another. In 1962, the, Lenin, uh, the theory was declared a doctrine universally accepted and titled The Principle of Peaceful Coexistence, the theory which was developed in in 1918, with a major focus on competition without war. Peaceful coexistence is not a mere phenomenon. Rather, it is a developed structure liable to fail or to be upheld. 
To that end, there are three major reasons peaceful coexistence can fail. These include, number one, excessive interests in acquisition of private properties and thus leading to creation of social classes. Two, a great imbalance between population and resources. Three, the old premier urge to dominate others. In number one, when national interests, when national or people's interests are overlooked, and preferably personal through commercial interests takes the center stage, then a wide gulf will be created between persons, the upper richer class and the lower poorer class. At the extreme, the upper class would tend to incite the lower class, and such activities would have a drastic effect on the fabric of unity. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and China developed the concept of peaceful coexistence as a mechanism for communist states to coexist with the capitalist states as led by the United States through NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the place of pre-dialogue. Before the actual assembling of resource persons and data for dialogue, there is the necessity to usher in a situation or event called pre-dialogue. This is mostly consultative in which fact-finding mission is to be constituted to assess possible agitations, complaints, likes, dislikes, and other various infavorables, which should be gathered with a concerned people, nation, etc. in mind. This will help to fine-tune dialogue and offer better approach for conflict resolution. Uh, the conflict resolution. Pre-dialogue, if done sincerely, could calm down situation as the people concerned would feel the sense of intervention at a lower level and may even, uh, uh, may even find grounds for pre-solution moves. Factions that need overhauling. To achieve a peaceful coexistence, dialogue is the key, especially when the fabric of coexistence becomes threatened. Certain factors, however, that need some overhauling in the process include, but not limited to number one, addressing the historical problems. Two, need to find, remember I said a bridge. Two, need to find a model for living together. Three, move should be made from negative to positive peace, which implies development, social justice, tolerance, equal or fair distribution of resources and satisfaction of basic needs of the population. Four, dialogue makes information and communication to be non-violent and erase hate, increases acceptance and equal participation rights. What dialogue must seek? Dialogue must seek to trace foundation, the foundation of perceived threats such as social injustice, fighting, clamorings, economic injustice, impunity, carelessness to the cash clo uh, cows and golden geese, and so on. To tackle these, a mechanism of justice and fairness, both in political appointments, rights, etc., must be developed and practiced, upheld, and surrounded by policy that works. Dialogue must seek to question individuals' role as agents for positive change. The concept of peaceful coexistence makes us more aware of the trivial acts of discrimination we might commit and therefore permit us to rectify our behavior accordingly. Aspects and policies that can enhance dialogue as a way to cohabit in peace lies on the abilities of the team to strengthen the people's through group, etc., cohesiveness. To this end, it is important for the perceived unity to be strengthened through the creation of an institutional model that is capable of handling diversity and even disagreement. Number one, negotiation. Number two, national dialogue and number three, mediation. We are aware 
of the NSAS uprising that turned the nation upside down some couple of months back. Dialogue was key to bringing to normalcy what the country Nigeria faced. Prosperity of a nation depends on how peace is managed. Dialogue is therefore regarded as a peace cost negotiation. The wise King Solomon understood this, and he had abundant prosperity for himself and Israel, the nation of, the, of, of, of time. What happened? Israel and people of surrounding nations and beyond had no peace at the time of David, but Solomon had a micro peace negotiation between him and unit families. This is seen in marital union and extramaritals he had with combined 1,000 families. What it means or boils down to was that if, if there was high probability rates that a cannon fired by other nations may result at least a loss of a grandchild to any of these nations. Therefore, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for dialogue to succeed, the unit, people, or group who suffer the immediate impact must be put to consideration first. If this is not done, the exercise could be just a political meeting or jamboree. The modern world is becoming highly fragmented, less peaceful, and unsafe for both present and future generations, engulfed by a environment of tension, violence, declining values, injustices, reduced tolerance, and respect for human rights. The worst faced in present time is terrorism, and this has become a monster which has resulted in catastrophic loss of properties and human life, ultimately hindering peace between ethnic communities and religions. Today, dialogue settles grievances, witness in societies, fills gaps on social, political, and civil engagements towards avoiding opportunities which miscreants include extremists might explore to manipulate people into engaging in violent extremist activities. Violent extremists take advantage of unemployment, especially among youths and productive adults who are economically vulnerable, out of school, idle, and socially frustrated without having any public platform to express themselves. And the violent extremist narratives come in the form of ideological messages, which are carefully crafted to target young and irresponsible minds, particularly those who are working to form their struggle. Increased level of intolerance, various gaps and violence in society today increase the need for genuine interfaith dialogue, tolerance, and harmony that will lead to a deeper understanding of and relationship between the other faiths and beliefs. Your Holiness, Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, by way of conclusion, like I said, a bridge. Dialogue provides opportunities and space to integrate and brainstorm together for a common cause, peace and peaceful coexistence. It builds understanding, reduces misconception, and develops healthy community service initiatives, sports and relationship programs, internship programs, promote peaceful coexistence, and build relationship in the community. In return, the community develops intellectually, socially, and politically. Dialogue, therefore, act as a tool to engage people of different orientation and calling with the sum of building understanding, goodwill, and sense of community service. Thank you, Your Holiness, and thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Prof, you see, see, as an academic, he took just 20 minutes 
maybe as you are not aware, he's a professor of systemic theology. He is the Director General of International Council for Peace and Justice, also the President of the Global Harvest Christian University and Coordinator of the Association of Christian Theologians in Nigeria. Thank you very much. We have a different kind of brother. Our brother from the Muslim faith. Ambassador Abdul Salam Paxman Ebuzu. He's a renowned Islamic sheikh and legate of the Sultan of Sokoto. He's the Director of Interreligious Affairs of the United Nations. Positive Livelihood Award, Polak, with the mandate to enhance the effectiveness of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. You're welcome, sir. 